the circus trying to find us out. But if you're looking for the truth, you have to find it out. There's a can't go to space, so we hit the roof. Get it hit the roof, and it all came to light with 200 proofs. Oh. Now I'm just really sick of people lying to me. So when I tell the truth, don't comply to me. Pick up the phone, get on the line with me. Line with me. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? Welcome, everybody, to Globebusters, Exploring Electric Gravity. I am your host, Bob Xanadude60, and we are back with another great show for you today. And we're going to be talking about um, the possibility of uh, exploring electric gravity. We have some very interesting material that has been uh, brought to us by one of our guests who's going to be on today, Mr. Zachary Zabala, Good Times for All. And uh, it is kind of going right along with some of the things that I have said in the past uh, regarding electricity being a major factor. Um, so we're going to give that uh, uh, kind of a, an honest look. And um, I am also going to, for the first time, read an email from my friend uh, who I have talked about many times, who is the PhD electrical engineer candidate who holds several degrees in electrical engineering. Guy's an absolute whiz-bang genius, and uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's incredible. And, of course, he is the one that is talking about, um, you know, how mass uh, does attract mass, but he gives some very good explanations for it. So I want to throw it out there and at least uh, let his side of it be heard because I have an immense amount of respect for this man. And, uh, you know, I think that all the more data that we can listen to, um, you know, the better. And also this guy, uh, my friend, has been a fan of the show for well, at least four years, um, the whole time that we've been on, has been very supportive of me and uh, helping with uh, some of the show topics that I cover. Um, he's just really a, a, a gem uh, to be able to help us out with this. So we're going to give him a little bit of a voice, even though I can't uh, reveal who he is, but uh, we can certainly reveal his words and uh, we'll be doing that. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and introduce our panel today. First up, we have Jaron from Jaronism. How are you doing today, Jaron? Doing great, Bob. Yourself? Doing fantastic. Beautiful day in Denver. Um, you know, uh, you can tell that falls on its way, but it's still really gorgeous outside. What's what's beautiful temperature-wise? Um, gee, what does my, my phone say? Uh, my phone says that it is 95 degrees outside. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so <laughs> it's hot over there. Yeah, same thing here. It's about a hundred here, so always fun here in the valley. Yep. Yeah, for sure. But uh, the trees are starting to, you know, just turn, get a little bit of hint of gold to them. And uh, when that happens, we always love to go up to the mountains because it is just gorgeous when the aspen turn in Colorado. One of the most beautiful things ever. All right. Was that an invite? I accept. Absolutely. Anytime, <laughs> man. I better hurry though before we're not here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I go there. All right, beautiful. And uh, I don't know where Iru is today, but um, he'll either be fashionably late or, you know, Linda's got him slaving on something. Never know with Iru. He's uh, always got something going on. But uh, we do have Ben with us, uh, Taboo Conspiracy. How are you doing today, Ben? Great. Actually, I just got back from a, a walk with the family. It's my daughter's birthday today. My daughter, Arwen. So, yes, I am a Lord of the Rings fan, but uh, uh, it's gorgeous. We just uh, just took the family along the, the river and we just had a great stroll. So I'm in a I'm in a good, good spirits today. All right. Well, tell her happy birthday from the Globusters, which is <laughs> I will. Gift in itself. <laughs> beautiful. Uh, your daughter's name is Arwen, like as in the, the flat earther Arwen guy. Uh, A-R-W-E-N, like the Princess Arwen in the Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay, because the, the Flat Earther R1 is A-R-W-I-J-N. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, I'd never heard that name before, now twice, so that's great. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so um, we do also have with us today uh, a person many of you guys know. Um, he has been staying with us um, for the past couple of months, helping us get our house ready for sale and 
Um, you know, not only is he fabulous uh, gardener, but he it turns out that he is an incredible all-around handyman. Um, you know, he, he can fix air conditioners, hot tubs, uh, you know, dog damaged doors, um, you name it, he can do it. He's pretty fabulous. Uh, and that is uh, Mr. Zachary Zavala, otherwise known as Good Times for All. How are you doing today, Zach? Oh, I'm doing fabulous, Bob. Thank you for those kind words. You've warmed my heart. <laughs> <laughs> glad glad to do it, Zach. Um, yeah, um, we are going to be checking out a couple of your videos today, and we'll be talking about those here shortly. But uh, some of the experiments that Zach has done, of course, you know, hanging around here for the past two months, and hearing me, you know, drone on and on and on about, uh, you know, my ideas of gravity and electric gravity and what's causing it and you know, all this stuff. Zach is the kind of person that he'll get in the shower <laughs> and then all these great ideas will come to him and he will get out and say, you know, I just thought of something really cool. Let's try this. And he will go and he'll do the experiments. And needless to say, he has gotten some rather stunning, um, seemingly inexplicable results. Now, like I said, I do have a friend that's going to explain that, um, but it certainly deviates a long way from what the mainstream will tell us. But uh, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to that, Zach. That's going to be pretty awesome. So, all right. So before we get to that, let's cover a few other things that uh, I want to talk about uh, this week. First thing uh, is something that um, Ben and I have been talking about for the last uh, several weeks. And this was Ben's brainchild. Well, I, I don't know if I could, if I can properly say that it's Ben's brainchild because Mark Sargent actually kind of came up with it first. But uh, Ben right, decided... Right, absolutely. Don't want to take anything away from him. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously it was a great series. I think everybody enjoyed that, you know, that with the subject matter experts that would uh, write in or call in to uh, Mark's show. And uh, Ben said, you know, we should really continue that uh, kind of tradition. And uh, I think it'll be very successful. So I was, I thought it was a fabulous idea, Ben. And uh, so, you know, I put my see, uh, st seal of approval on it. And we're going to go ahead and move forward with it. So this particular um, project is called Globebusters Pro. And as many of you may have noticed, uh, Ben put out a video on it. And let me go ahead and uh, share to the left here. Uh, ben put out a video on it uh, just last night. And uh, it is mirrored on our channel and on his channel. So Ben, if you want to talk about this and a little bit about uh, you know, how you thought of this and uh, what you uh, hope to uh, glean out of this. Well, you know, it, it did start with Mark Sargent, but I, I did a series where I I collected a whole bunch of professionals uh, together in a certain video and I, I really loved it and I love the idea and it was so instrumental for me to, I don't know why, sometimes it's good to hear from some of these, some of the people who deal with it on, on should be dealing with a curvature on a daily basis and actually hear their, uh, their experiences, hear their testimony about it. And it was very instrumental for me to, to, to see the, the, the flat earth and, and I, and I, I feel that we just needed to provide an open forum for people to find us, people that maybe uh, don't know how to, to share their experiences with, uh, with their profession. Um, but, but by doing it this way, I think we can get everyone who wants to be on, on. Um, surprisingly, I, I actually been getting quite a few negative people. And I, I guess you, are, are you guys familiar with this? I don't understand why people are so against things like this. Um, but I, I can't, I, I can't see how this could hurt us. It's just about, uh, giving the people a forum that have a, a, a professional background and, and doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be an engineer or something, but, uh, uh, anyone who, who, who should be experiencing that curvature in their daily business or something, um, to come forth and share their experiences. And yeah, it's not, not exactly like they have to be a, you know, a whistleblower, um, you know, they can simply say, look, you know, uh, for example, uh, there's a guy in the UK, uh, I, think, I believe it's called uh, Level Earth Observer, who's got some really fabulous stuff. But, uh, you know, he runs a crane, you know, one of those great big, huge cranes. And I love watching his videos because he makes some of the most profound observations and, you know, says, you know, this, if really, it seems to me that if the Earth were a spinning ball, this would be happening or you would have like these folk halt effects on the crane or anything like that. And of course, these are the kind of observations that he makes. 
And, you know, whether you want to think they're valid or not, um, they do, all of them seem to carry a certain amount of weight. So it doesn't have to be like something that is direct whistleblower technology, like you're coming out and telling on the government or anything. But, uh, you know, just, you know, everyday pr professions that uh, deal with this. For example, you know, in my own uh, experience uh, as a uh, RF technician, uh, engineer, field engineer, that uh, we installed point-to-point uh, -point terrestrial microwaves, right? And it, it was not until Flat Earth that it occurred to me that when we would uh, bypass one, two, or three of these sites and uh, make microwave shots nearly 200 miles, that, you know, we shouldn't be able to do that, especially on some of the sites that we built across Kansas and Nebraska, right? So that may not be conclusive to some people. Uh, to me, it certainly was because the earth curvature over those distances is absolutely prohibitive. Um, that would not allow that to happen. So to me, it was pretty convincing. But um, again, what we're after here, folks, is a preponderance of evidence. And, you know, people coming forward with, the, with these experiences that have, you know, specific expertise uh, in fields that uh, don't seem to go along with, uh, uh, you know, the ball earth model that is promoted to us, is that's exactly who we want to hear from, right, Ben? Right. And uh, I, I did want to emphasize again that th these interviews will be confidential up to the point that you want it to be. So if you want to remain entirely anonymous, we, we, we will recognize that and we're not going to release your name or anything like that. Um, also, it's, I'm sorry, I was just I lost my train of thought there. Um, but anyway, it, what, the way to get in contact with us is go to uh, Globusters, send us an email at globusterspro at jaronism.com. And uh, from there, we'll just get in contact with you and try to set up a, an interview time and these uh, interviews will be pre-recorded, so, and we'll also give you the opportunity if you want to to review the video before releasing it, and that that way we can avoid uh, any things that you might find embarrassing or something. So, uh, I, I think these it shouldn't be scary or anything like that. So please, uh, if you think that you would qualify for for talking with us on this program, please do send us an email. Yes, absolutely, and well, I think we're going to do this separate from the Globuster Show, of course. Um, uh, or at least the Sunday show. I mean, we might do something on a Saturday or maybe some other day or evening, but uh, uh, or we'll just maybe just make it a video. I don't know. It's hard to say, but uh, we'll figure all that out. Regardless, um, since it's all going to be pre-recorded, we can really uh, premiere it at any time. Um, so we'll just we'll figure all that out. But uh, yeah, I think it's a super idea. And um, again, if you work in any of these fields that uh, seem to contradict what we've been taught. Um, in the ball earth model, please contact us. We've already had uh, two people that have contacted us. One person in particular, um, uh, again, is a uh, ballistics expert in the military, and uh, he's uh, willing to come on and share all about, you know, what goes on uh, with these ballistics, um, that they don't seem to be obeying these Coriolis effects and stuff like that. And another guy was, uh, I believe, an, uh, an AutoCAD architect, right, Ben? That that's yeah. That has been in charge of uh, detailing the AutoCAD civil engineering uh, for large pieces of construction. So where you would expect that somebody would take into account the curvature of the earth, especially in something like that. So, you know, the architects will come up with the idea for something on, on a big project, but it's really the AutoCAD people. They're going to be laying it out on paper. And so they would have to know whether those accounts are, 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 are being considered. Absolutely. And, you know, again, when you start considering the incredible amounts of uh, curvature that, that cumulatively build up to that eight inches per mile squared. Of course, we know it doesn't happen, but you know, we got to play their game. We got to show their silliness. Um, then that would definitely become a factor in engineering. I do not care what anybody uh, says. There was a, a civil engineer who we haven't heard a lot from. Uh, uh, his name was Jeffrey Sanchez um, that came out, of course, and he talked about, you know, never in all of his I think uh, 20 plus years of civil engineering and he did roads and bridges and all kinds of stuff like that. Did he ever take anything like curvature of the earth into consideration? Um, and of course the ballers, well, whoa, you know, we can just treat it like a flat earth, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, whatever, dude. But, but yet you can see boats disappearing over the horizon. Go ahead, Jaron. <laughs> I just said, of course you can. I wonder why that. <laughs> 
yeah, it's pretty funny. So, so yeah, I think that's going to be a great uh, project. And, uh, yeah, hit us up on an email, GlowbustersPro at Jaronism.com, and uh, help us kick this thing off right. That would be beautiful. So, all right, next item up. Um, let's see. Ben, you did another – whoops, that's, that's the wrong one. You did another video this week um, that I kind of wanted you to highlight. And this is really good because – um, once again, it gives us some rather stunning photographs uh, of things that are way beyond the horizon that uh, simply we shouldn't be able to see. So you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. It's, um, you know, I've, I've done quite a few videos. If anyone is familiar with my work, I've done quite a few videos on Beyond Horizons website. And it's, it is absolutely a treasure trove of things that you should not see on a globe. I mean, and in this example, it's a it's a peak to peak in France, um, 250, 254 miles uh, from Peak de Nouffants to uh, Peak del Estrel, Estrel, I think. Um, but uh, the the top of the peak, we're not talking the, the mountain itself, but the top of the peak should have been 2,400 feet below the horizon. And I don't, I mean, I don't know how much of the mountain you can see, but it, it seems like you could see, I, I did try to do some initial measurements and it seems like you could see thousands of, of feet of the mountains at least, but it's, it's quite difficult to see from that far. But I mean, you just go on the, the Beyond Horizons website and you can find uh, 30 examples of, of, of peaks that do not fit with the globe model. <laughs> and this idea of selective refraction, I have to keep pointing that out, selective refraction. We're, we're talking about, like, I think it was Jaren who originally pointed this out. If they're saying the mountains are ref refracting up above the horizon, then what about all the land between the mountain? And it, how come that isn't refracting upward too and still blocking it? So they're saying only the distant mountain is refracting above the horizon to become visible, to present this false flat earth. And I, it, the, the excuse is getting so ridiculous that I can't even tolerate it anymore. It's just, it's, it's asinine. If you could go out and prove that things can wrap around a curvature with, with refraction and you cannot notice it and it looks like a flat, fake flat, uh, false flat earth, if you can do that, then maybe I'll be convinced. But so far, no, no Globe supporter has done that. Has even come close to doing that. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And of course, you know, it's funny because we uh, lately I've been kind of getting on the, uh, some of the Discord chats and you know, one of the things that they talk about is, of course, the Globers are always on there talking about, you know, making their case. Well, it's refraction, it's refraction. And it's like, you know, what we have discovered so far, and we have video evidence to prove this, um, uh, you know, by multiple sources, not only FE course sources, but Dr. John D, who is a PhD uh, spectropis yeah, spect spectropicist, oh, crud, I can't even say that, I don't know why. Anyway, in spectroscopy, there you go. <laughs> uh, in his tests that he did, um, you know, again, we see massive upward refraction, especially over water, um, you know, of these laser beams. So how do they explain that? And that is the norm, ladies and gentlemen. That is more normal uh, than, you know, these incredibly so-called rare uh, uh, encounters of the... the uh, light refracting downward right it just yeah and, and what's what's hilarious to me about that is you can go to to marseille and what and look at the canago twice a year and film the sunset behind it twice a year at sunset so if this is a rare phenomenon it's like is this refraction on a, on a tight schedule to perform every twice a year for the canago yeah, yeah it makes no sense to me and especially when you talk about whether refraction is caused but, but what is it caused by? Is it caused by the sunlight? Does it happen also with the moonlight? Uh, I think there's so many questions. And, and again, we've never seen it shown or proven in any way that things can bend up over curves and then present themselves, like you said, for a false flat earth. You know, just, oh no, it just looks that way uh, because of magic. And it's so easy for these Globers just to come up with a new number. Uh, you know, oh, we can go with seven six the radius. We can go with, you know, anything that they can do to make it so that it can be explained away. And then people just all accept it, believe it. And because you can't see the very bottom of a mountain that's 175 uh, miles away, you know, in like Canigou's uh, spot, which again, that observation is from a thousand feet high. And, you know, you're looking at a mountain 175 miles away that's supposed to be uh, nearly a mile below the horizon. And yet you can see the top peaks of not just 
the very peak of Kanagu, but all the mountains on the side of it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And isn't it amazing how, you know, the refraction just happens to cooperate every year, you know, when the sun sets behind it, um, you know, for such a beautiful <laughs> shot. <laughs> and, and another thing I want to mention about the refraction is, for instance, like uh, on one time with my wife when she was across the lake and I was filming her and you could see her, the light reflecting off of the water, but not just that light. You could see all the lights from uh, across the, the water reflecting as a mirror would. On, on the flat lake. And so you ask them, you say, well, which ones are not refracting? And so how, how in the world can you have a mirror like reflection off of things that are mm -hmm. refracting upward? It makes absolutely zero sense. How, how, I mean, what, how, how, how does it refract evenly all the way up as high as you can go? It just continually refracts evenly to present a false flat earth. And if that's the case, isn't that as interesting of a conspiracy that the our our world tr likes to trick us into believing in a flat Earth? I mean, isn't I mean <laughs> I, that seems pretty crazy. And if and if that's the case, why aren't scientists discussing it? Because that would be a very fascinating topic of why is the world tricking us into believing in a flat Earth? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, go ahead, Jaron. Oh no, I wasn't saying anything, but I did oh. just send I just sent an image to the chat here. Um, that I always think it's just classic. It's the one that we see all the time. And if that's your your explanation for, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, you know, but this is their their explanation that uh, the mountain is actually behind the curve, but somehow uh, because of the sun, you can see where that big red dot is. That that's where we see the peak of the mountain. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to think that this is how the world would be displayed to you. That it would somehow bend up the mountain. Uh, to the top of where you're viewing it, it's just ridiculous. And again, it, it, they're able to say anything. It's the same thing as, like I've said many times before, when we talk about the the mirror experiments, the mirror flashes. That you know, when I talked to that independent investigations group, and they just said, "Oh, well, what you're seeing is just traveling around in the in the atmosphere, staying close to the Earth." And again, we've all heard all this nonsense that if the Earth was six times bigger with the same seven six R, that you'd be able to see your own ass. So. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Mike, they, Mike Bull had a good video on that one and you were there Jaron where they had the laser going across was 18 miles and you could see the source of the laser and you could see the reflection on the water and so they're saying the source of the laser refracted upwards plus the reflection on the water refracted upwards to present this false flat earth I, I'm sorry I'm just not going to even allow that discussion on my channel anymore it is stupid it is nonsense it is ridiculous come on with something better because that's I'm just not going to tolerate that at one anymore. Yeah. No, it simply just doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive with reality. And again, they can't even show any kind of short range experiment where you can see something behind some sort of edge that's rising up and then displaying itself perfectly. And again, we're not the ones saying that, uh, you know, these guys all go back to, it doesn't matter, for instance, that you can see any of Kanagu, even though you're not supposed to see any of it. They'll just say, well, why can't we see the shore? I'm like, well, <laughs> it's 175 miles away. And the shore is where the thickest part of the atmosphere is. You also get the lensing, and then you also get all the mirage effects of the water. And think about how much miraging effects there is over water when you're looking at a sailboat. That sailboat is, what, three, four, five, six, seven miles away. Sometimes we might see a, a tanker or a, sh you know, a, a carton shipper. Uh, those boats may be 20 miles away, 30 miles away. But we're talking, in these cases, of hundreds of miles, you know, 150, 175 miles. Well, you're just there's so much mirage going on. Of course, you're going to cover up the bottom of that mountain. It's not going to be able to be seen, and it's too small to be seen anyway. Anything that distance is too small to be seen, unless you're talking about a huge mountain range. And when you are talking about that one time a year where the sun gets behind it, uh, you're not seeing any colors of that mountain. You're not seeing any detail. What are you seeing? You're just seeing a silhouette. And to believe that that silhouette is somehow being lifted or displayed for you in a place where it really isn't is ridiculous. Yeah, and typically when. Jared, uh, uh, Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. Go ahead, Ben. You're good. I was just going to mention, Jaron, I, mm -hmm. I, I just remember as years ago when you put out that video, as Red's rhetoric, put out that sailboat that was supposedly disappearing over the curvature. And you went in and you analyzed it and showed that it was just reflecting upon itself. That was a big one for me, uh, where it was just like it, 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 it totally dawned on me that these people are lying. You right. know, Red's rhetoric, Red's rhetoric should have came out immediately and said, yeah, you're right. And I, didn't. I almost thought that he would for, I mean, back then, you know, that way before I, yeah. knew, I knew him now. 
But uh, yeah, I thought when that video came out, I said, oh, well, this is great. They'll be able to say, oh, well, in this case, he's right. That they, No, but they just doubled back and said, no, again, you're wrong. Uh, and of course, they have to do that. And that's kind of what I mean about these long distance. It's not like we're going to show them some mountain 175 miles away and they're all of a sudden going to just change their mind. Now, some people do. Some people can switch ships like that. But when you've gone on making fun of flat earthers for three years, four years, uh, you're never going to see the light of day. You're going to keep arguing your position and coming up with whatever nonsense you have to to um, try and get it across to people that you've been right this whole time, even if you haven't. Yeah, and that's the truth. You know, and the crazy thing about it is um, they will take these silly arguments about uh, the refraction, um, you know, being the cause for everything. And by the way, refraction, like I said, does not always go down. It does go up. We have video proof of it going up. Um, in Epi Core's experiments, as well as uh, Dr. John D's, so it, it that is more the norm uh, over water, especially. But the thing is, is that you know, as you, as many of you know, uh, Epi Core is going to be doing uh, our second attempt at the uh, 307 kilometer microwave uh, experiment, and this time I'm pretty sure we're going to make it because what we did is we ordered up a whole new rig, as I uh, showed last week. Uh, we have received that rig, and it is like, oh, 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 more power, right? <laughs> and it's not that we have more transmit power, but the dishes are bigger. And when you have dishes, uh, a bigger transmitting antenna, uh, you get something that's called gain out of it. In other words, you have a higher effective radiated power that comes out of it. So, you know, just like we have been talking about about, you know, RF waves do have a finite distance they can travel, not because of the curvature of the Earth, but because of the inverse square law. They, they get to a point where they are simply too weak to be able to be pulled out of the mud or the, the, the background noise. Okay, so now we have higher gain so we can punch the signal through, and I have every confidence that, we're, that we are uh, going to get a signal lock this time. And not only that, it's going to be a, a reliable signal lock where we can actually transmit data. Now, I don't know exactly how long we can keep these antennas up. Of course, that's a, an agreement that uh, uh, Mike Kavanaugh has made with the, the site owners and stuff. But um, if you saw the video, you know that uh, it is amongst many, many other antennas. It's going to be a 307 kilometer shot. And look, you, if we can keep it up even for 24 hours uh, where um, we can get a reliable data stream, you know, overnight, um, then or even just for a little while, really, um, that, but overnight would be ideal, and of course, the longer the better. Um, it just tells you that, look, refraction is not going to stay bent in that unbelievable, and I do mean unbelievable, uh, 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 no, nah, what's the word I'm looking for? Orientation, let's put it that way, um, so that we can make that signal work. Um, there are... There are requirements, and one of those requirements for microwave to work is line of sight, not magical refracting atmosphere that, that you know, just refracts that we can count on every single time. It requires line of sight. Therefore, when you look at the curvature calculations of this 307-kilometer microwave shot that FE Core is going to be doing, um, the, the curvature calculations are absolutely prohibitive. There is no way that we could possibly be getting a signal through the core of the Earth, right? And, but again, that's exactly what the Globers are going to claim. You know, what do you do, right? <laughs> well, we keep presenting it, the, the nonsense it is. Yeah. We just keep fighting. All you can do. That's all you can do. Yeah. And uh, I do think, some, you know, gradually people are opening their eyes and seeing the fact that we do see too far. And that's all I guess I can hope for. And I, I keep putting those videos out, hoping that people see that. This, or this is a, a fact. We see too far. Yeah. Right. And if you want to claim there's magical properties of fairies that are, are bending that over the, the curvature of the earth, come on. Yep. Yeah, and it just happens that some days you can't see very far at all. You know, some days you can probably see, you know, three, four miles, and then everything is just uh, kind of opaque. And then you have a clear day, and all of a sudden you can see a little bit further, and then a super clear day, and you can see even further. Uh, but they've always kind of described that edge of our uh, viewing circle, if you will, as the edge of the ball Earth. And after you realize that, wait, I'm seeing further, I'm seeing further, now I'm seeing to impossible distances that wouldn't be possible when you take the curve calculations into play, then you're absolutely right. We have to keep uh, telling people this because it certainly isn't things being lifted up from behind curves and shown to you uh, some inexplicable way. Yeah. 
And, you know, I think, honestly, the trolls coming back and saying, oh, it's refraction, oh, it's this, that, or the other thing, but it's always refraction, right? By them doing that and, and forcing the flat earthers to keep coming back with example after example after example, whether it's the 200 proofs of lighthouses that Eric Dubé has or Effie Kohler's microwave experience or uh, uh, experiments or what Ben does or what Jaren does, I mean, we just keep absolutely inundating, you know, with examples of we see too far, we can transmit too far, we see lasers too far, we see mirror reflections too far, um, all of this stuff, and we just keep coming out with it. So therefore, you know, the people that that are denying this, well, it becomes pretty apparent uh, at one point or another that they, they are either in cognitive dissonant denial or they're just trolls, right? But anybody with a reasonable mind will look at all this evidence, you know, just absolutely flooding in, and they will say, wow, okay, they're right. <laughs> we see too far, we can transmit too far, you know, yada, yada, yada. We're, we're always breaking these rules miraculously sometimes. So that, those are the people that, that we're looking to. And, of course, the trolls will be the trolls, and they will always deny it. And, you know, like I said, just looking at that type of opposition, and much of it is paid, in my humble opinion, um, you know, they have to do this. They have to do anything they can do to cast doubt on these irrefutable proofs. Uh, it's as simple as that. Yeah, and, it, and, and the refraction excuse only works for a few things. I, I mean, and it, it doesn't work in those, those respects, but I mean, they can't use it for, what do they say, the airplane that's automatically adjusting its nose by refraction? No, I mean, they have to use gravity or air density or something else. So all these properties of nature are continually trying to trick us into believing in a flat Earth. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the gyroscope, uh, the mechanical gyroscope, they say is also automatically adjusting for the curvature and the rotation of the earth. Again, it's like, uh, what is that refraction or is this a, some new uh, magical force invented for the globe to keep the globe alive? Yeah, exactly. So again, you know, trolls, you're doing us a favor really um, by forcing us to just keep coming out and punching you in the gut essentially. Um, and then of course your denial becomes comical at a point. <laughs> it just does. So there you have it. All right. Well, anyway, it's a great video. If you haven't seen it, check out Taboo Conspiracy 2's channel. Uh, check it out and, uh, you know, check out all of his videos because, again, all this is about, you know, we are uh, seeing over and over and over again um, all this evidence, this huge preponderance of evidence for Flat Earth. And the Glober's got nothing, man, absolutely nothing. And we're going to be covering another gem that happened this week that a lot of people are uh, talking about as well. But before we get to that, um, I would like to, I, I, you notice I've been uh, talk, showing uh, this 432 hertz music. Now, I don't know what you guys know about 432 or the esophageal scale of music, but it appears that at some time back, we went from the esophageal scale to a diatonic scale. And I'm no music expert, so if I get any of this wrong, you know, forgive me, people. But uh, it appears that the esophageal scale was made in music initially to be a very harmonic, resonant thing um, to the people that are listening to it. Uh, it actually promoted cell regeneration. Uh, it promoted good feelings, good vibrations. Uh, it promoted healing. Uh, so many things. Uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. And, you know, as part of this agenda to make the world discordant and make people turn on each other and everything like that, um, I, think, I think that the diatonic scale was very purposely introduced because it is, frankly, discordant in many ways um, to uh, people and their, right down to their very biology. And this is something that has been proven um, scientifically in a number of ways. So. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into that. That's not the, uh, the uh, reason for this. The reason I'm talking about the esophageal scale and specifically the 432 hertz, which I believe is the uh, first A note above middle C, if I'm not mistaken, um, that is something that when music is tuned to that particular frequency, uh, seems to have a very profound effect, very profound positive effect on people. Well, where am I going with this? Well, where I'm going with this is uh, many of you may have seen uh, Conspiracy Me. I know everybody is familiar with uh, 
conspiracy music guru, or Alex, um, Flat Earth Man. And he is going to be releasing a brand new album. Uh, it's coming up this week. This is on his particular channel. Um, and he gives a little bit about, uh, you know, the Sophageo scale and the 432, a little bit of uh, history behind it, and uh, shows also how it goes perfectly along with cymatics. It's interesting that the Sophageo scale cymatically produces some of the most beautiful and coherent patterns there are, just like what this guy is showing here. Um, and I forgot this guy's name specifically. We've covered him before, but uh, he does some great music. Um, <laughs> some amazing stuff that shows cymatics. But uh, so Alex is, is going to release a new album uh, that's based all tuned in this 432 hertz. And I got to tell you guys, he sent me a track this morning uh, and said something like, Bob, you know, if you want to really mellow out uh, before the show, take a listen to this track, right? And he sent me a track that was called Heart. And I have to tell you that, you know, I love... I love the, the you know guitar music in general. One of my uh, favorite artists out there that that plays this type of uh, guitar is a guy named Mark Knopfler. And Mark Knopfler, of course, many of you know him from Dire Straits. But he has uh, an album out. Um, oh God, I forgot the name of it. Ah, uh, anyway, I'll think of it here in a minute. But anyway, it's it's largely acoustic guitar, and some of the songs in it are absolutely beautiful. In fact, I will post one of them in the show notes. Um, but Alex, uh, this song Heart that uh, Alex sent to me this morning um, really, really uh, reminds me of Mark Knopfler. Uh, screen playing, by the way, is the name of the album, uh, guys. Um, anyway, so this song that he sent me really, really reminds me of uh, a few tracks in screen playing. It's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful music. As soon as it started playing, guys, and I'm, I'm not kidding about this, I just got this incredibly warm feeling. Um, it absolutely just touched me uh, in a way that, that, that I can't even describe. Uh, it almost you know, brought a little bit of a tear to my eye. And when I played it for Cammie, it did. It made her just out and out cry. I mean, she was so touched and moved by it. It was absolutely beautiful. It is a long departure from the typical uh, you know, Flat Earth Man stuff, which is awesome, of course. But uh, this just shows another side of Alex uh, and his diversity and how incredible of an artist and musician this man is. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm sorry, I just, I just got my attention grabbed by something. So, Zach, you heard, uh, since Zach is staying with us, Zach, you got an opportunity to hear this uh, track, and uh, give us your take on it. What did you think of it? Yeah, it was, I didn't, I wasn't expecting that. It's, a beautiful instrumental piece and man can he play a guitar and it's just i don't know it resonates when you're listening to it i had trouble concentrating on what i was doing and i just stopped and i just started i just sat there and listened and yeah, yeah. it was it's beautiful yeah. like you said it shows another side of alex it's just wow it really does. Um, and, you know, Alex, you know, obviously does a lot more than his Flat Earth Man stuff. He is a, an incredibly talented musician. He's a fabulous singer. Um, you know, there's a few, I think he has, well, maybe only one track that I know of. Uh, the, uh, the song, ah, I forgot the name of the song anyway. Uh, there's another track on him. Of course, he's not singing his Flat Earth Man. Uh, it's a beautiful track. But this, this shows a side of Alex, which I had no idea. I knew he was a uh, fabulous artist, but wow, uh, absolutely mind blowing this. So guys, I can hardly wait to hear the rest of the album. If it is half as good as the track heart that he sent me today, um, it's, it, it's going to be amazing. Absolutely amazing. So Alex, thank you so much for that. You are, I would say a rock, a rock star, but it goes far beyond that. <laughs> really, really beautiful work. All right, cool. So enough for that. And now let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. Let's see, what do I want to talk about next? Um, let's talk about P-Brain's new video this morning. Uh, that actually, that came out this week. And I think you guys are really, uh, if you haven't seen it, you must see it. But uh, this was absolutely fantastic. So P-Brain uh, 
does a video in response to Bob the Science Guy, who very arrogantly comes out and says, oh, well, anybody that looks at this reflection, uh, you know, over Mount Rainier uh, is showing a shadow on the clouds, and that can only happen from the sun being below uh, Mount Rainier. Well, you know, I have to admit, this has been kind of a puzzler, you know, for me. And I remember, Jaron, you and I, the first time we saw this, remember you and I were positing that, well, maybe maybe what's happening is the sun is reflecting off the water and bouncing it, uh, you know, and causing that shadow to happen, right? You remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we were having some definite questions about it because uh, it was interesting. But we looked at it and, you know, it only happens rarely. And, uh, yeah, so we had some questions about it for sure. And we had some answers too, that kind of fit, but I think after watching P-Brain's P video, you're just like, oh, well, there's the answer. Yeah, exactly. And this, and so basically what P-Brain is saying, and he backed it up with some fantastic pictures. Um, and, you know, it's amazing that I never thought of this before, I have to admit, because, um, as you know, my oldest son used to live in Seattle. Now he lives in, in uh, 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 South Korea, <laughs> and he's going to be moving, apparently, to New York City. Oh, my God, I don't know why, but... Uh, you know, good job, good job opportunity, but I would never live there. Anyway, so Brandon, my son Brandon, uh, used to live in Seattle. And of course, Cammie and I would fly there a lot. And every time you fly into Seattle, you get this fabulous view of Mount Rainier. And almost every single time that we did go in, we would always see Rainier just peeking its peak out from the top of the clouds, uh, you know, much like, you know, what what is being shown on this video. But it never occurred to me. It's like, oh, okay, so... What P Brain came out with is he showed some footage uh, that is showing this that the top of Rainier peeking out, and of course sunrise is coming up, and it is behind Mount Rainier, and it is casting a shadow down on the clouds, and you're able to see it through the you know the transparency of the clouds. That's exactly what you're seeing here. You're not seeing a shadow being reflected up on to the clouds. You're seeing you're seeing it from the underside what is coming down from the top. And, uh, you know, when he explained that and then also showed, you know, how the perspective fits into it. I mean, this guys, this is a masterpiece. It is absolutely one of the best, I think, flat earth proofs out there uh, showing that, no, the sun never, ever, ever drops below the horizon, even though it can have an apparent position that as it moves further and further away, that it is going down on the horizon. That is an apparent thing only. We all know that it's not dropping below the horizon. The Globers will never acknowledge that, but every law of perspective, which they deny completely, uh, dictates that this is so. What do you guys think? That's genius. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Once you realize what the height of the mountain is and what the height of clouds are, then it all starts to kind of make sense. So, you know, we, we sometimes might forget and just assume that that mountain must be below the clouds and that the clouds must be above the mountain. And if we're seeing that shadow, it must be coming from a low sun. Uh, this explains it so much better when you realize that the, you know, the peak of that mountain is above the clouds. And that, of course, the shadow is being cast down on the clouds and you're just seeing that from from below. When the, yeah. when the video came out, I immediately got on the Internet and just Googled, you know, shadow pictures and Mount Everest uh, shadow and you could see so many people took pictures of the shadow cast by Mount Everest at sunrise many times. And it's always down. I, I mean, come on. <laughs> people can put that in the video as well. I just, that's what happens. Perspective changes things. Uh, you know, it's like looking at a uh, globe, globe supporters going to look at uh, power lines and go, look, those, those power poles down there, they're really small. You know, come on. It's common sense here. Yeah. Yeah. It's perspective. Yep, it's it's full perspective, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think people said it well there that they love to say that, but it's simply because they don't understand it. They never were taught it, and uh, it smashes you know a lot of the globe proof if you just understand perspective and the way we see things. Uh, so they're not even going to look at it. Yeah, they would they would want you to believe that uh, we see everything orthogonally, right? Uh, in an or an orthographic type of view. Uh, right. which is ridiculous. We don't, and anybody knows that. I'll, just pay attention to what you're looking at, people. You know, right. things converge from the sides and from the top and bottom. And that is one thing that the Globers will always, you know, try and discount our arguments with. In fact, um, you know, 
these these like the the Canago pictures, for example, or the the video that you did, um, Ben, uh, on all the other mountain ranges, they'll say, "Wool, no, the question here is, is how come this amount is hidden from the bottom?" It's like, right. no, no, no. The question is, why are we <laughs> seeing it at all, right? Uh, but that's what they'll try and divert the conversation with. And they show me the video of the mountain peak slowly peaking up and rising up to present this fake flat earth and then sinking back down below this uh, curvature. I mean, that never happens ever. No, it's just like the buildings across Lake Michigan, right? Uh, it's the same thing. They're going to ask, well, why can't we see the bottom floor? It's just ridiculous. <laughs> why are you seeing the buildings at all? You're not supposed to see them. Of course, we're told, as I put at the beginning of all my videos, that it's a mirage. And, and, and these guys will just believe that. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me. These are the same guys who, you know, still are arguing that we need to level the laser to shoot <laughs> water. You know, I mean, so at a certain point, you just need to, to kind of throw your hands up and just say, well, it's been four or five years. And these are things I thought that we had ironed out already. And when you yeah. realize it's still it's still their argument that, well, you didn't you didn't level the laser. Well, it doesn't make any sense to. We don't have to. Uh, otherwise, if we lower it, it'll hit the water. If we raise it, it'll go above the target. It's hitting the target, which is impossible when there's some sort of a hump of earth or a hump of water in between you and that distant observation. Yes, they're absolutely true. So, yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing uh, piece of work by P-Brain. And, of course, P-Brain uh, is, you know, one of the OG flat earthers. He's been out there every bit as long as we have, as far as I know, maybe even longer. I don't know. I, I can't remember a time when P-Brain really wasn't around. But, uh, you know, he, his work on, on perspective is absolutely fabulous. In fact, it was from watching his videos that made me realize, you know, how an, a, uh, an EQ mount telescope can work on a flat Earth and does work on a flat Earth. And also understanding those rules and laws of perspective um, he completely debunks the idea that an EQ telescope can work on a ball Earth. It simply cannot. And of course, I, I answered their challenge. Uh, we showed exactly how it works with your, uh, you know, personal atmospheric dome, if you will, um, because, you know, we and our eyes, we perceive light coming in and the scenery around us exactly the same way that, that the convex uh, uh, lens in a camera does. Uh, they work the same way. The, the perspective works the exact same way. And so the telescope will work the same way. It also will have a per personal atmospheric dome of vision, right? Um, and if you omit that, then you can say, well, uh, it works because of the curvature of the ball. But the problem is, is you can't omit that because that's the way our vision works. That's the way uh, concave lenses work. It's just the way it works. So if you were to take that into consideration and then put it onto a ball earth, it wouldn't work at all. Absolutely would not work at all. So, uh, you know, ballers, huh, explain to me how an, an EQ mount can work on a ball earth, given what we know to be fact about perspective. And the answer is you can't. There you have yeah, it. Yeah, and that, you know, the like P Brain's, uh, uh, we've all discussed it now, and I was just talking about it with uh, Wide Awake this morning about the anti crepuscular rays and how those things, I mean, I, I I, just, I can only catch them once in a while, and I always I film them, but I just love them. It's so amazing to see how those rays all of a sudden up, up above your head, you look up, and all of a sudden they, they, they converge again. And when that happens, and it's like, how can, you not, how can you deny the perspective is influencing what we see? I mean, when you look out the distant clouds, and Jaron had that example years ago, or you're looking at, out at distant clouds, why do the clouds always seem to hover, get smaller and smaller and hover at the horizon? Why are there always so many clouds farther away? It's because they're all converging at that, that, that vanishing point. And if that's happening, then it also has to be influencing the, the stars, how we see stars, how we see the sun, how we see the moon. And where is that equatorial amount adjusting for the, for the perspective? There is no perspective adjustment. No, no. The perspective is built right into the scene itself. Um, it's, not, it's not orthogonal. It's, <laughs> it is... <laughs> It is a converging type of perspective. That is a fact, pure and simple. And, and the fact that they deny this absolutely floors me. It, it really does. It's like, what is wrong with you people that you cannot see the obvious, what your eyes are telling you? And don't tell me you can't trust your eyes. If you understand 
how the eye works, how optics work, and we do. We have a very good understanding of it. Uh, you know, denying this, uh, you know, converging perspective is absolutely uh, ridiculous. And, and you only show your foolishness by doing it. So... I think if, if clouds are proof of anything, they're, they're definitely proof of gravity waves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Scott, speaking of that. <laughs> There's that picture. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, that picture of the, the waves in the clouds. and they say <laughs> Yeah. Do you have that link, Jaron? I don't have it handy. Can you post it? And I'll, I'll bring it up really quick. I, I want to talk about that. I know you sure. covered it on your show, but. Uh, you know, Cammy found that and sent it to me, and I posted it in Globebusters, and I saw that you covered it on your show. But oh my God, people, this is classic. <laughs> yeah, give me a second to find it here, and I'll send it across. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it might be quicker if I find it in the. Uh, let me see if I find it here. Uh, yeah, it's in our chat. It's. Uh, I think I I put it in Globebusters. I know that. Okay, so I'll find it there. Yeah, just scroll up there in the in the Globebusters or yeah, whatever. Or I could do it, but I'm talking, so I'll let you do it. But you talk, I'll find it. All right, I'll talk, you find it. All right, so what we're talking about, guys, is there was a an article right that came out, and I, I can't remember it was space, uh, you know, space.com or wherever it came from. I'm not not sure, but we'll know here in a minute. Yeah, it's Channel Nine News. I remember. Oh, that. that's right. Yeah, Channel Nine. Well, Channel Nine News aired it locally here. Or published it locally here. Um, and there it is. All right. So let's bring that up. Let's drop this guy down here. All right, guys. <laughs> so this is absolutely classic, right? So here it is from 9news.com, which is our ABC affiliate here in Denver. And it says, you can thank the clouds for revealing this otherwise invisible phenomenon. Well, we've all seen these modulated type of clouds. And of course, it has always been my position that, you know, what is causing this modulation, in my opinion, um, could either be um, a, uh, you know, a weather wind type phenomenal, fun phenomenon, um, which is a possibility, but I tend to, you know, lean a little bit more towards the conspiratorial side of things. And I think it has something more to do with HARP or uh, Nexrad, uh, where they are literally causing pressure changes and modulating the clouds in the sky. Now, whether you believe either one of those or not really is pointless to the point of this article, guys. <laughs> because now scientists are asserting that clouds, as a result of gravity waves, yeah, you got it, gravity <laughs> waves, look like ripples in a pond due to the air rising and sinking. These clouds from gravity waves sat above the Boisevane, uh, Manitoba, in Canada on Sunday, August 18, 2019. Oh, my God. I, I mean, how do you even address this? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever so heard in my life. You just read it, and then that's all you can do is just show people. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've got contraptions built with the most high-tech uh, you know, testing experiments, trying to get, you know, proof of these gravity waves, which of course they got, you know, a hundred years after Einstein predicted them. But now just to look up in the sky and say, oh, no, those are gravity waves that are causing those clouds is, is simply ridiculous, especially when you hear them talk about what they believe gravity waves are and how minute they are and how they're traveling from trillions of miles away and getting here. And if you think that they're coming through and then doing this to clouds, you just, you're willing to believe anything. Do you yeah, think that, the, that, that this flies in, uh, that this explanation is valid in academia as well? I mean, I, I just can't fathom how anyone with any, with a modicum of intelligence can look, hear that and, and think that's true. And are professors agreeing with this? It's just nonsense. No, I mean, the one thing that, you know, I think, and maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I, one thing Bob just said that I'm not sure actually says it is he said scientists are saying, I don't think scientists are saying it. I think that this meteorologist is saying <laughs> The Ministry of but, Truth says. <laughs> right. But it, it could be wrong. Maybe, maybe this is, you know, maybe they're actually trying to push this as being true. When I read the article, I kind of looked at it as there's some meteorologist who is claiming that that's gravity waves. But mm. maybe, for all I know, maybe scientists are starting to lean that way. I, I haven't seen anything about that. Maybe, you know, Bob's right. And uh, I'm wrong, but I think that just the article itself seems to be some meteorologist saying that uh, this is gravity waves, which <laughs> I don't know if science would back that. I really doubt they would, uh, but who knows? Yeah. 
Uh, Zach, Zach, were you going to say something? I was just saying, how could it just affect the clouds and not everything else? <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Jaron, you're right. Uh, it does say a meteorologist, and so uh, I may have overstepped my my uh, uh, words there by saying that it was science. But you know, uh, there you know the mainstream is more than happy to promote promote this nonsense, right? So right. It, it's hard to say. And not only that, now they go and they show these next rads. Now many people are familiar with the phenomenon known as radar rings, and it's interesting to note um, that when these these NEXRAD stations the, the, the go online, um, not only do we see these radar rings pop up everywhere, um, you know, or these gravity waves pop up everywhere, um, but they also seem to fire up these steam generators uh, and they start dumping just tons and tons and tons of steam uh, into the air at the same time. And then all of a sudden these fronts seem to get pushed around by these so-called gravity waves or radar rings and they, you know, seem like they hit very strategic targets, in my opinion. Of course, like I said, yeah, I believe in a lot of these conspiracy theories um, because I think there's a lot of merit to them. But, um, you know, one thing I'm not going to buy into is the idea that these are gravity waves. That's just stupid. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. And uh, I don't know why people just will accept that. Other, I mean, it's just ridiculous for, to me that people will hear that and accept it. Uh, but again, it's anything said in the mainstream, anything said on the news, people will just uh, buy into that all of a sudden. Uh, it what can just easily be described as less dense clouds and more dense clouds and kind of air blowing through them uh, has to be now changed to uh, results of gravity waves, which is just a joke. And we've gone over, we have shows we've done on LIGO. So if you've watched any of those shows, then you've seen uh, how ridiculous gravity waves are to the point of them building these four mile tunnels in the desert. Uh, but to go even further now and say that gravity waves can be seen in clouds uh, from, you know, basically exploding nebulas. I don't know what they say. <laughs> Where are these gravity waves coming from again? I know as Bob always says, it's in a galaxy far, far away, of course. Yes, yeah, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> right. so, so that's where they start and then they travel uh, to us it, it's just ridiculous that people see these and, and will now chalk these up to gravity waves. Nonsense. Yeah. It's pure propaganda. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we brought that. Oh, by the way, did you see, I think you did, Darren, I think you mentioned something. Did you see uh, Diana Cowan, uh, physics girl, talk about yep. <laughs> the, the, the LIGO facility? Yep. Yeah. I have that link too. That was uh, pretty funny. Uh, why are they, why are there giant, concrete tunnels in the desert is there that just came out uh august 23rd yeah but it was pretty funny to see her and tell she sits there and and she seems like a nice girl it's hard to uh, hate on her but uh then again she went to school she studied and she says gravity waves are her absolute obsession and uh yeah she wants to talk about how great these things are and and how wonderful it is and how she thought in school that they would never uh, you know it would be years until they were proven and that now that they've been proven by LIGO, and again, if you mix into that, these clouds, and of course she doesn't mention these clouds, <laughs> but it's just interesting the timing of that coming out. Yeah. Yeah, show, show us in these tunnels how they account for the curvature of the Earth, too. Of course, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, yeah, they say that, but, you know, there would be a fairly substantial, I think at least three feet. Um, and of course, you couldn't really tell it by looking but if I ever got the opportunity to go and tour one of those facilities, uh, I would want to be looking at those very, very carefully. And, uh, m you know, I doubt they would ever show the blueprints for that. But I guarantee you there's no correction for curvature uh, whatsoever. That's just ridiculous. But, uh, yeah. Plus, there's many earthquakes going on all the time. And the fact that you'd be able to pull out what is actually... Uh, a slight shaking of the earth below you, what is possibly shaking from wind or anything, uh, and then pull out of that and say, no, this is actually gravity waves that have come from trillions of miles away. It's just something to captivate an audience, which is what it's done to the physics world. Yeah, and the, the, the gravity waves just so, so happen to happen every time the, the subway goes by. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, in, in all fairness, you know, I'm not sticking up for LIGO, but supposedly the way that that is avoided is 
if if it is a true gravity wave coming in from a galaxy a long time ago, right? Um, then what will happen is it will cross both the Hanford and the uh, Livingston LIGO facilities simultaneously, and there will be a synchronized chirp, right? It'll give a little chirp. Oh, there's our there's our true gravity waves, because you know we've got a pattern that matches both of them at the same time. Um, but you know I, we've gone into I won't go into it again today, but there are so right. many problems with the LIGO facility, uh, yeah. not the least of which would be. Uh, the Lorentz contraction, uh, ironically, never seems to affect either one of them or, or many other things. But, uh, yeah, it's nonsense. Or how, how come we don't see these gravity waves when the sun and the moon are above us at the same time, uh, combining their gravitational pull together? Or uh, when they're on the opposite side of the Earth below your feet, how come we don't sense that? And, and where, are these, where are the sensors to measure the, where the, the sun and the moon are located at, at precisely just by measuring the gravitational pull? I mean... Yeah, we have to search for distant for for gravity waves from trillions and trillions of miles away when we have the sun and the moon supposedly pull you know the moon pulling the tides and the the, the sun and the moon comp- hold, uh, with these tremendous gravitational forces at all times. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty silly, and and the case just grows ever weaker. And now, uh, now, and I'll cover this in a future episode. Now they're they're coming up with an entirely different angle on uh, this space gravity that they're talking about. And of course, you know, as we've said many times before, whenever they try to apply this 9.8 meters per second squared gravitational constant that, you know, is apparent on Earth uh, to the space, to the cosmos, it doesn't work. And this, of course, is the reason for the introduction of dark matter and black holes and quarks and muons and all this other crazy stuff um, so that they can make their equations work. And even then, they don't work. So uh, they're, really, they're really struggling on this uh, to make it happen. Of course, I believe that, that you know, if, if the gravitational effect, um, as I see it, is in fact uh, an electrical thing, and even my buddy, uh, uh, the uh, PhD uh, electrical engineer, agrees with that. It is electrical, um, but um, you know, obviously this would not apply uh, out in the cosmos. So anyway, we'll uh, come to that in just a little bit. But uh, first, I want to do a little commercial here, more or less, and I want to plug uh, a couple of events that are happening um, the first, of course, um, at uh, feconvention.com. Uh, you guys, uh, conference season is coming. It's getting ever closer. And, uh, you know, these events, as we talked about many times, are a blast. Uh, they are so much fun to go to um, and not so much about, you know, that you're going to get any top secret knowledge revealed about the flat earth or anything like that. Uh, it is largely a social occasion, and everybody acknowledges that. Uh, there is some good information that's presented, but it is more an opportunity to... Um, be able to kind of network and connect with like-minded people. Um, and to me, frankly, it's priceless. And a lot of people feel the same way. And unfortunately, I, I've noticed the people that are really against it are the ones that cannot afford to go to these things. And, and believe me, I sympathize with that. Um, they are expensive, but you know, just because you can't afford to go to it doesn't mean that uh, you know, you should try to diminish the experience of those who, who do have the money or have saved up or worked hard or whatever to be able to go to these things because it truly is. It's like anything else. It is a social thing. It's for personal enjoyment. That They're really wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I highly recommend them. So the first one that we're going to talk about uh, is the effieconvention.com. And, of course, we've got the Kidderminster uh, coming up on September 13th through the 15th. Um, in the UK, Kitty Minster UK, and there's going to be a lot of great speakers there. So uh, if you want to, if you're in that area or going to be in that area, by all means, I would recommend that you uh, go and check that out. The other one uh, is, of course, the Globe Lie European Tour, and we did a fundraiser for that just a few weeks back, and uh, um, they are already out uh, doing that. They've got the motorhome going, and I watched a feed with uh, Roxanne and uh, Jason. Uh, Disbury, um, and the, you know, looks like they're having a lot of fun, and they've kicked this tour off, and it's going to be uh, ongoing. So please uh, go and show them some support. And then uh, finally, in Amsterdam on the 27th and 28th uh, of September, um, they are going to have the Amsterdam Convention, which of course Jaronism is going to be speaking at, along with a whole host of other uh, uh, people that are going to be there. So that sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, huh, Jaron? Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it, and it's uh, you know it's it's not even that expensive. So if you're in that area, 
um, I think $100 buys you two passes to that Saturday event. And then Friday is going to be kind of an informal thing. And then Sunday we're going to be meeting up with the Globe Light Tour and doing some street activism. So it's going to be a great time, and I hope to see a lot of people out there. And again, yeah, if you're from the United States or in Australia, uh, it's probably a little bit out of your reach to go to that event. But for anybody who's in that area, uh, please come say hi. Please come watch the presentations. There's going to be a lot of good people there, and it's going to be a fun Friday, Saturday, Sunday event. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And, of course, uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, Karen B. and uh, Just Jack's Flattoberfest um, uh, event that is taking place. Um, and, of course, there's going to be, uh, I will be there, uh, Karen B., uh, Rob Skiba, myself, Mark Sargent, Authentic Intent, um, and also a couple of bands that are going to be there. That's uh, pretty awesome. So it's going to be, and it's actually a very cheap event. Um, gosh, I forgot how much the tickets were. Let's find out. Let's go over to the tickets tab here. And um, I think they're 15 to $30. So very much a, a budget type of thing. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it takes place at a, a venue called The Firmament in South Carolina. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you can't afford the big conferences, um, you've got... Uh, uh, Sunday and Monday, October 20th and 21st uh, at the Firmament in Greenville, South Carolina. You can come and join us there. That should be a lot of event. And then, of course, this all culminates with the granddaddy of all the Flat Earth Conventions, uh, FEIC 2019 in Dallas, which is coming up in 73 days. That's going to be amazing. We've got so many great uh, speakers that are going to be there. Of course, we've got Owen Benjamin. It's going to be doing a comedy routine there. That's going to be fabulous. I can hardly wait for that. And I'm really looking forward to meeting Owen and uh, kind of giving him his own personal uh, lesson on one of his biggest questions about Flat Earth, and that is how ham radio waves propagate around it. Uh, there is definitely an answer to that, and I will be uh, kind of explaining that to him, and it's going to be my honor to do so. So um, lots of people that are going to be there. And, and something I just found out, guys, that, that I was blown away at, but apparently, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but apparently Coast to Coast AM is going to have a crew there. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> I didn't know that. News yeah. to me. Yeah, George George Nuri and company. Uh, of course, it used to be Art Bell's show. I used to listen to it, you know, for years. Of course, they always had Richard Hoagland on. And, uh, you know, back in the day when I was kind of sucked in by his BS. But nevertheless, um, you know, they do, they do cover some of the more off-topic type of things. Um, I don't know if they're going to go there to try and make it a hit piece, but uh, I'm going to uh, do my best to try and um, interact um, with them. Uh, go ahead. Oh, Zach, were you going to say something? No, no, I didn't unmute. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm hearing things. I'm hearing a little, little uh, uh, video blips anyway, or audio blips anyway. So yeah, they're going to be there. I think that's going to be pretty cool. Um, and I think that will be some really good exposure for the flat earth, assuming it's not, you know, something that's going to be a hit piece, but uh, um, I'm really kind of looking forward to that. I think that'll be a lot of fun. So um, yeah, that's coming up uh, November 14th and 15th in Dallas, Texas. And uh, we're looking forward to that and hopefully we'll see a lot of you there. All right, beautiful. All right, so we have gotten through that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to Oh, you know what? I, I know what I want to talk about before we hit the main subject. Um, <laughs> this is kind of cool. Let me find what I did with it. I've got my things all out of order here. But let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So <laughs> many of you probably were aware that um, SpaceX did a launch this week. Uh, and it is... Uh, this little R2-D2 looking garbage can thing called Starhopper, right? And it's pretty funny because uh, Level Earth Observer um, did this piece on it, and I actually mirrored it. I thought it was so good on Globebusters. But um, what he's showing here is when this thing takes off, and this is like uh, kind of from an overhead view, uh, what we're looking at is we're seeing the star Starhopper come off, and, of course, they've got this dramatic, you know, I don't know if it's supposed to be dust, 
or if it's supposed to be rocket exhaust or what exactly it is. It looks to me like it's more um, dust than anything. But out of this, this cloud emerges this R2-D2 trash can looking uh, spacecraft and it's kind of tooling around. And you, you know, we've got all of our typical CGI you know, hallmarks uh, that are in here. But the thing that uh, Level Earth Observer pointed out in this, which I thought was really quite amazing, is that when you look at the rocket exhaust, of course, and this, this thrust would have to be considerable, right? It would have to be putting out a huge amount of, you know, well, obviously look at the dust cloud it allegedly raised, right? There's got to be a lot of force there that's coming out of this. But the interesting thing about it is, is as it traverses over its own dust cloud, and it does appear to be in the middle of it, You've got stuff behind it. You've got stuff in front of it. This is apparent, um, stuff to each side of it. And, you know, it does not appear that anything is moving in these dust clouds, right? And in addition to that, it also does not appear to be casting any shadow on these dust clouds, um, which, oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. Let me back up. Maybe I did see a little bit of a shadow. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay, I take that back. Uh, I, I'm catching a little bit of a shadow uh, off to the side here. You'll see it. So at least they got that part of it right. Um, but anyway, so it doesn't appear to be affecting these dust clouds at all. And, uh, it, you know, to be fair to the Globers, they have come back and rebuttal and said, well, come on, you're seeing that that's CGI, but there were hundreds if not thousands of people that witnessed this launch. And to that, I say, you're right, there were. And I'm even going to show the footage of that as seen from, you know, whatever it is, a mile and a half away, right? Here you've got your massive dust cloud. Um, and <laughs> I'm sorry, but that just looks cartoonish to me. Um, and yeah, okay, so these people saw this. It's interesting that they cut to this, this view, right? That just, that just looks so disproportionate to me as it comes out of there. Look how big it is. Right when it come, emerges from that that dust cloud, look at that. It just seems very disproportionate. So, so what is going on here, guys? What do you think we're actually seeing here? I don't believe for a second that that this is real, or if it is, maybe it's something that's tethered, you know, highly uh, from a helicopter above it that is using some sort of cloaking. I don't know. I mean, I'm completely grasping at straws here. But I do know that many angles of this and many things about it, just like the, the SpaceX rockets, seem to defy the laws of physics. Um, it, it, most of all, I think it's crazy that they can keep this thing stable, uh, at, you know, just like they did the big uh, rockets um, that SpaceX did with one single pivoting engine that it can respond that fast, right? So I'm not sure what's going on here. Obviously, people saw this. We're looking at you know, somebody that actually has filmed it. But there's just something about this that doesn't seem right to me. What do you guys think? I'm just not sure what's supposed to be impressive here, to be honest. It, it goes up, what, 450 feet? So I'm just not that impressed that we can move trash dumpsters 450 feet in the sky and then bring them back down. Uh, what is it supposed to be? What, what is this going to do? They call it a star hopper. Is this supposed to fly to outer space and then go land on Mars? Yeah, and, and take off and land to other parts of, you know, Mars or the moon or whatever and, you know, do it all automated. Um, so I guess they're trying to show this technology as being, you know, viable. And maybe, you know what, maybe it is. Um, and maybe. I'm not, go ahead. No, I was just saying maybe it is. You know, uh, may, maybe it is uh, viable to have technology that can move, a tr you know, a huge dumpster or whatever, 450 feet in the sky. But are we supposed to believe that this could keep going up? to any height that they want it and travel, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 feet. I, I'm not really sure what the, uh, the point of it all is. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, people seem to see it, seem to show it. Uh, I think it's possible that we could be doing that. Again, I always go back to the moon landings and, and just laugh at the fact that supposedly we had a craft like this that you could put people inside and it could take off from the moon and it could get, connected to another craft that was in orbit of the moon and it could fly all the way back to earth and it could drop into the ocean and the people could get out and just be just fine. And if we could do that 50 years ago, then this is not impressive. And why are they actually doing this? Cause I thought the excuse was that those, they couldn't build a, a lander that would actually work in on the earth. 
So why are they using it, testing this one on the Earth? Right, because they say you know something landing on Mars or something landing on the Moon would be entirely different. Uh, yeah. So why are they even practicing it? And if you were to practice it, wouldn't you drop it out of a, out of an airplane and uh, get the pilot, get the the controllers used to a a wild descent? Yeah, I'm just not sure what what is supposed to be so impressive here. But uh, again, it only went 450 feet. So, yeah. but I'm not surprised that we can we can create things like this. I mean, that that doesn't surprise me that we can uh, build some sort of a rocket engine. <clears throat> excuse me, build some sort of a rocket engine that can take off and go 500 feet. It's just and then come back down and land. I don't think it's that impressive. And they haven't even put people inside of it yet. So again. We're supposed to believe 50 years ago they're launching people, you know, through the atmosphere, through the troposphere, into orbit, uh, traveling around, heading to the moon, landing there, getting out, playing around, getting back in, launching that craft from the moon, uh, you know, with exploding bolts. It's just, it seems ridiculous to me that this should tell you that the stuff that they're telling you they did 50 years ago, they didn't do. That's what it tells me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And of course, you know, I, 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 I suppose it's not even hardly newsworthy really, except that the, the ballers and the, you know, NASA and SpaceX fanboys are making such a huge deal out of it. You know, like, it's like, okay, so they took it off and they landed, but still I can't help but look at it and just, there's something about it that does not seem realistic to me no and, and, I, I agree it looks like a, a cartoon to me yeah i mean especially the, the the first footage not so much the second one they did a better job but that first footage it, it's a cartoon i mean you can see it so i actually think they're using a combination of fake footage and real footage to, to kind of the, the 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 high viewpoint i think is absolutely fake uh the lower viewpoint i don't know um but again i guess what, what jaron said it's not that impressive anyway even if that was the case but I, I don't know. It, it seems to me like you guys mentioned before about the possibility of these things being half helium or something to keep the nose up or something like that. I, I don't know. Or right. is this uh, are we witnessing projection technologies that we, we don't know about? I mean, if with fifty three million dollars a day, did NASA develop something that's uh, pretty amazing with projection technologies? I don't know. Yeah, well, that's you know, I think that would go a long ways. Um, in explaining a lot of it, because, you know, the physics behind it, like I said, don't seem to match. When you look at the ocean waves behind it, um, there are times when it's when they seem to freeze. Uh, and this was especially prevalent in the, uh, you know, the, the big rockets that, that they launched, uh, you know, uh, the right. boosters coming. Uh, you can see that happen. They are getting better sometimes, you know, maybe they're listening to us and taking tips, but um, <laughs> there's just something not quite right about this. And I think, you know, it could very likely be uh, either a projection or we could have a helicopter or something up there that is cloaked. And, and that technology we know absolutely for a fact exists. Um, we, I, in fact, I've shown it on Globusters before uh, in a segment where uh, they use a technology where essentially it takes these cameras and it projects on the side of the craft or whatever they're trying to camouflage uh, the the imagery that is behind the target, right? And that could very, very possibly be being done here. And you're right, Ben, we have talked about the possibility of, you know, these rockets, when they go up, they just lumber. And it's like, how are, how are they, um, you know, keeping it from tipping over and falling over? Well, one sure way that they could do that is to pump that nose cone of that uh, rocket full of helium. And that would give it an element of vertical stability um, and I think that's entirely possible. This could be a balloon that's tethered on the ground, for all we know. Um, it's just, it's hard to say, but something about it is wrong. And this, the physics of the smoke and the dust below it are not, in my opinion, are not commensurate with what you would expect to see with this huge blast wave that would be coming down into it. Um, it's like right there. It's virtually unaffected. How is that possible, right? Yeah, and it, and it does look like that they're putting smoke generators under these rockets as well. Like, it doesn't look realistic to me of what the smoke's coming from. It looks like they pumped that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, it, it's I mean, does that look like that's dust or whatever came from it? It doesn't look at it at all. It looks like it, it came from the ground. You almost see, like, columns. Am I wrong? Can you, like, see columns underneath that cloud? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to say, but you know, we're we're you know just spitballing here. But uh, like I said, this 
This seems to me that's impossible. Look at that. It's not being affected at all. It's got this nice leisurely climb. Um, this should be being absolutely blown away, in my opinion, right? Um, there would be a huge blast crater. And, and you know, some people are going to say, well, that's because it's, you know, way in front of it or way behind it. And it's like, no, I don't think that's the case. Because, again, and then they, it will get down to a point where, you know, it almost have to uh, have a blast effect. Now, like right now, see, we're starting to pick it up here, but it's not being picked up up here. There's just something really phony about this. I think all this dust is being generated from the ground. I'm with you, Ben, on that one. I just watched that video a couple of times, and I, I can see almost it looks like pillar columns underneath the cloud, which doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so, you know, just something I thought I'd point out uh, for you guys, because uh, when I look at this, I think it's a load. But even even if it's absolutely for real tech, big deal. You know, this is what they have to show us, and this is what they demonstrate us, that they can move an object 450 feet or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not even newsworthy if you want to look at it like that. However, the, fake of it, the fakeness of it, in my opinion, is newsworthy. Um, and I am very interested into how they are actually pulling this off, because um, I don't think we're dealing with real physics here. But and, and and we're dealing with actors too. Did you see that other video where the guy's like screaming about, "Oh, this is going to be on Mars. This is going to go to Mars." It was so so ridiculous. It's so fake. <laughs> yep, ain't it the truth? So, anyway, you guys uh, decide that one for yourself. Um, uh, I don't know, but uh, I don't buy it. That's for sure. So, anyway, uh, all right. So now let's head back and go back into what I wanted to talk about. Um, on the main subject today, uh, which of course is exploring electric gravity. Now, many of you have seen this. I'm not going to play this again, but um, I've talked about the uh, that that, in my opinion, and also in the electric universe's opinion, this phenomenon, whatever it is that we call gravity, that that seems to uh, you know cause things to fall down or whatever, uh, has has you know has been ex well explained in my opinion, by uh, density and buoyancy. However, again, there's still something in my opinion that sets this bias. And this, this bias uh, that sets this up and down uh, change is a, an electrical type of phenomenon. And believe me, so many people, this has been a hot subject for a long time um, where you know some people believe in it, some people don't believe in it, some people believe that relative density is a force, um, which, you know, whatever. Uh, and some people believe that, yeah, yeah, there is something that's there, whether it is mass attracting mass or it's electrical or it's magnetic or it's a three-headed hydra, uh, as Ken Wheeler would assert, of dielectric inertial acceleration, right? Um, which is, uh, you know, kind of his take on it. And we covered that a little bit last week and we're, we'll go into it some more. But so, you know, in my case that I've been building to kind of say, well, you know, whether gravity, so-called gravity, is caused by electricity, it seems that varying electrical fields within this so-called gravitational field seems to have certain negating effects upon it, okay? Which I find puzzling, right? And, and of course, one of the things that I've used is this particular uh, video uh, by the University of Bristol, which talks about spider ballooning. And uh, essentially, the conclusion that they came to in this video was that, um, you know, like we we talked about uh, that uh, uh, science has has disclosed to us, we do have this electrical static electrical potential of 100 volts per meter, and this, of course, is being represented by these blue lines in the background, um, and it is measurable apparently up to 50 kilometers, which gives us a difference of potential of about 5 million volts on average. So what happens here is the spiders will raise their abdomen, they will fire a silk shot into the air, and then they will alter the charge potential on that silk strand. Now, NASA does something very similar where they claim, of course, they claim that they do this to their satellites in space, but they say that they release these long tethers that are hundreds, thousands of feet long, potentially even kilometers long, um, and what they do is they change the electrical potential of these tethers, which allows them to cause the uh, satellite or balloon, in our opinion, 
uh, to go up and down, right? So this seems to be a fairly well documented and substantiated case. Um, and so we have kind of looked into this even more. So let's go beyond this. And there's a guy that we've covered before, and his name is Boyd Bushman. And Boyd Bushman is a, a retired Lockheed Skunk Works engineer. And he talks about some of his experiments, uh, you know, with, with being able to manipulate or influence the so-called gravitational effect. Um, and in his particular uh, experiment, he talks about, uh, he took a couple of neodymium magnets and he, he put them inside of a brick, um, apparently hollowing it out so that the bricks weighed basically the same thing. Uh, and of course they had the, ex the identical uh, volume on the outside. And of course that's important because, you know, if you're dropping them through an atmosphere, if they don't have identical volume and shape, well then people are going to claim that the aerodynamics of those particular objects being different are going to change their drop characteristics, which of course would be absolutely true. Okay, so anyway, he says that he put these magnets inside of uh, a couple of uh, one brick and then dropped it from a, a fairly high height. And I'm going to actually let him uh, describe it here. And um, every single time the the brick with the magnets in it fell slower, considerably slower than the brick without the magnets in it. So let's let Boyd take it away here and uh, I'll let you guys. Uh, hear what he has to say, because this is really uh, pretty interesting. Here we go. How about that? No proof that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Well, I went up to in, in the Lockheed Building 501 mm -hmm. by the side of escalators and, and elevators. Oh, wow. And I got, I got, uh, I got, I got uh, nine guys that were not educated and didn't have pre, didn't have, uh, Free opinions on anything, mm. and I dropped my two rocks, mm -hmm. and, and I said, "What I would like you to do is," I told him, "What I would like you to do is, I would like you to take whichever one arrives first, get it in your hand, and when I come down the elevator, hand it to me." Mm -hmm. Now they looked identical, except for so, uh, and nobody went, knew what was inside. Not, them? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. All the nine times that I tested it. It's as though the one with the opposing magnet field extending out mm -hmm. three feet on each side. I actually measured how, how far big the field is. How big the field was. And on each side of a rock, the, of one rock, I had a total of six feet. At any rate, the other the other rock arrived first. Which one arrived first? The one, the one that had no magnetic field in it. So you were able to cancel out gravity to a certain degree. You were you able like to that? cancel, Precisely. reduce the mass gravity effect. Precisely. By, okay. po by opposing fields. Isn't that nice? You, you bet. And got nine signatures and what... I always skip... You, know, you I, did that at Lockheed? I, what what year was this? Oh, uh, at least eight years ago. This is um, the actual document of Boyd's where <laughs> he proved that by altering the the field mm -hmm. in a falling body, the magnetic field, it reduced its mass gravity equivalent and canceled out the uh, effects of gravity to a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And he did a 500, a building 500 drop test conducted from a height of 59 feet. Mm -hmm. The location is in White Settlement, Texas, and the time was 12.20 p.m. And this was in 1995, December 12th. Nobody yeah. knows this. I know it. This so gravity, is, mass gravity, is not. Um, well, that, it, you can alter it. In well, other gravity, words. Uh, gravity within itself has to have. Gravity goes through anything that is solid and anything like iron or anything yeah. else. Okay, so essentially, what Boyd is saying here, or what he has demonstrated, um, is that by taking uh, two opposing magnetic fields and and essentially. He, I think, he put the two north ends together, the two south ends together, um, causing a strong repulsion uh, in this field. Um, but when he dropped it, for whatever reason, this magnetic field changed the drop rate uh, as it went down, right? Very interesting. There's been a few other people that have validated this and experimented with it. And lo and behold, the magnetic effect, and remember, Ken Wheeler has said that this magnetic effect um, 
is part of a three-headed hydra of electrostatics or electricity, electromagnetism, and gravity. They're all same. They're all three heads of the same hydra, and they are all products of a, a an acceleration towards a uh, dielectric point. Okay, and we actually demonstrated that on uh, one of Ken, Ken Wheeler's uh, videos last week. So it's very interesting that we've got this guy that's doing this, but this is not the only uh, type of uh, phenomenon that seems to defy gravity. Now, in this video, and this is, this is not even anything that has anything to do with electrostatics or gravity, but this has to do with rotational properties. And, of course, we're all familiar with gyroscopes and how they have some very interesting properties, uh, not the least of which, of course, is rigidity in space. But gyroscopes um, seem to have some sort of anti-gravitic effect as well by nothing more than a mass rotating at a fairly high speed. Now, this is a great demonstration because, um, if, and I'll have this in the show notes, but if anybody has ever seen this video, Professor Lakethwaite um, does some really, really dramatic gyroscopic demonstrations and their gravitational, um, you know, resistance, if you will, when they're spun up. And in this particular thing, he's going to show a couple things. You've got a, he's got a little boy um, that he's going to spin up a uh, a gyroscope or ba basically a big heavy weight uh, flywheel on the end of a, uh, a metal pole. And this little boy is going to be able to hold it up above his head where, you know, beforehand, there's no way that you can even hardly lift it, let alone lift it above your head. So what's going on here? But let's actually take a look at this, and then I'll show you another area where he is showing that when it's placed on a spring, it actually relieves the spring tension or pressure of the downward force of, uh, you know, what we're calling gravity. But let's go ahead and watch this first. This is really interesting. This weighs 18 pounds. The shaft weighs six pounds. Would some strong fella like to come and try his strength? Try lifting that up with both hands at one end like that. Who's gonna try? Come on. <laughs> All right, grab hold of the end. Okay? Whoa. <laughs> Heavier than you thought, isn't it? Yep. Try again. Now do it with both hands at one end. <laughs> You're never going to make it, much. Right. Now, we're going to give this to Dennis, and we've spun it up to about 2,000 revs a minute. <laughs> and he's going to show you his feats of strength. Okay. Right. Nice and easy. Nice and easy first, Dennis. Take a good hold, that's it. Yeah. Get your hands further back, Dennis. You got it. Your hands further back. Pull your hands in. Well done. Slow it down. I can make him lower it. Or raise it. Okay, so as you can see, and this is really interesting, uh, the, the weight becomes like a feather to this little boy. He can lift it up over his head, no problem. Uh, the only compensation is, is he seems to have to take part of this rotational uh, inertia uh, on himself. But in exchange for that, there, you know, there appears to be this somewhat of an anti-gravitic type effect. Really super interesting. Now, I'm going to go up here a little bit. And uh, anyway, let me get to it here. Okay, they're going to spin it up again here in just a second. But so what is what is happening here? And this is something that, that I have to tell you that, that Eric, Eric Waith, Lathwaite took a lot of heat over these gyro experiments. In fact, uh, they have really kind of gone out of their way to try and um, discredit him and his work with the gyroscope. On this, which I find very, very interesting, right? But, uh, and where is that part? There's a part in here, essentially, 
and if I miss it, that's okay. But yeah, he will actually put this rotating gyro on a spring, on a spring weight, right? And as soon as he spins up the gyro, the spring decompresses as if the there was literally the weight had been taken off of the uh, spring itself just by the spinning up of the gyroscope. And this might be it, but I thought it was a bigger uh, a bigger part. And uh, no, that I don't think is it. But anyway, well, you may have to take my word for it. I will put this in the show notes. So it's very interesting that this rotational uh, ability seems to defy gravity. So what's going on there? Well, this isn't the only example of this. There is another example, and this is done by a guy named Bruce De Palma. And I've talked about this before, but essentially Bruce De Palma was famous um, by an experiment called the, the spinning ball experiment. And essentially what happened is Bruce spun up, first he just, he popped up a, a ball bearing, right? And it had a very distinct curve where it rose, you know, to a certain height and it had a certain amount of sustained time and then it fell off, right? And then he took that same ball bearing and he spun it up to 27,000 RPM and it went higher and seemed to have a longer hang time and, and then came down a little bit slower, allowing this distance to be, you know, this arc um, to you know, kind of be elongated. Well, a lot of people really, this put a lot of people up in arms because this seemed to defy typical Newtonian mechanics, right? Or, you know, the way that people understood gravity. And even to this day, people try and debunk it, but their debunks are really kind of sorry. So I looked up in Yahoo Answers, and this is kind of bizarre. They say, what do you think of the spinning ball experiment of Bruce De Palma? And uh, the best answer, right? Okay, well, they say a pinball rotating, rotating in the horizontal plane will go higher and fall faster than a non-rotating pinball thrown upward at the same speed. Doesn't this violate our current understanding of gravity? Yes, it does. So the best answer, and this is crazy, he says, phew, what crap. What is happening is that the spinning object has less drag because of the velocity of the air being drawn across its surface by the spin produces a low pressure zone due to Bernoulli's principle. Air drag drops as the pressure goes down, becoming zero, of course, in a vacuum. All right. Well, you know, that, that answer sounds great on the surface. But the problem with that is that Bernoulli's principle um, is required, it, it's used in a context of, well, let me give you an example of a wing, for example, uh, how they teach us, you know, how a wing works, right? They say that Bernoulli's principle, and they may not even have this uh, picture in here, uh, but if you can imagine a wing, right, an airplane wing, and over the top of the wing, you have a longer distance supposedly to travel than across the bottom of it. And this higher speed air going across the top supposedly causes a, a low pressure zone because it's, it has to go further, uh, faster over the top, right? And thus they say the, the lift of an aircraft wing comes from the top. Well, the problem with this is this is a non-symmetrical type of surface, right? Whereas a ball bearing is completely symmetrical all the way around. So as far as the ball bearing, you know, creating this no pressure zone that would defy gravity, um, I don't think that's applicable at all. Because again, it is a completely symmetrical type of thing. Um, you're not really reducing uh, or causing any low pressure. And not only that, it would seem to me that, the, that you would have different effects uh, depending on which way the ball itself was spinning. So, you know, in my opinion, this answer is bunkum. It is, it is not applicable, and bringing Bernoulli's principle in this to debunk the, the spinning ball uh, experiment doesn't hold water, right? So now we have, what we've seen so far is we have magnetic fields that have seemingly uh, debunked uh, the 9.8 meters per second uh, downward acceleration of gravity, or have changed it, you have De Palma spinning ball or rotational things like gyroscopes that do it. And now we have something that uh, our guest today, Zachary Zabala, um, has come up with. And this, of course, like I said, I, he did this, I think, as a result of me 
uh, inundating him with my ideas of gravity. <laughs> so uh, sorry about that, Zach, that, that you had to be subject to that. But uh, <laughs> out of it <laughs> has come some great results. So what I want to do, Zach, is I'm going to play this, and, and I'll uh, keep it muted. But uh, I want you to kind of describe what you came up with here and what actually happened in this first video with the scale. Yeah, what I did, um, it's a very high accuracy scale um, used for measuring gems. And I just took a uh, metal can lid, uh, put a, a wire to it and wrapped it all in electrical tape. Now I did that to keep the electrical charge from dissipating so quickly. I tried to hold as much of the charge as possible. And um, now when I did it with the positive charge on it, um, here at the house, we saw it was up to three grams, I think. 3.2, I think, was the highest I saw. And then with the negative, it would still go up, but it would only go up to about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, somewhere right around there. And what I'm thinking is the negative was maybe pushing away from the surface and the fact that it was pushing away it was like holding itself up a little bit, possibly off of that metal plate on the scale there. And that's why it was picking up a reading. But you'll see later that we didn't get a reading with the next test that we do. But there it is, the Van de Graaff generator, the wires hooked to it there. Um, it's a positive charge right now. Okay. And so Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Were you finished? Uh, go ahead. Continue on. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say um, I zeroed it out with everything on there instead of trying to um, zero it out and then set the object on there. Right. I had it all it. on there. Yeah. Okay. So essentially then what happened is, is when Zach would apply a charge from the Van de Graaff generator, um, we would see the weight change on the scale itself. And that was pretty interesting. And we would get, you know, as we change the polarity of the um, object itself coming, you know, coming off of the Van de Graaff generator, we would have different changes in weight. Now, as you're going to hear here in a little bit, there is an explanation for that from, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call him mainstream, but uh, he is brilliant uh, nonetheless. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of read that explanation. But essentially what is happening here is that by changing the charge potential of this device, you have somehow interrupted the coherency of the charge field of the Earth and changed the weight, not the mass, but the weight of the object, which is uh, pretty interesting. So when I looked at this experiment, I thought to myself, well, you know, the first thing the Globers are going to say is, well, you're dealing with a very high static potential charge there. And it's probably just affecting the uh, electronics of the scale, which, frankly, I think is a viable possibility. So Zach thought about that for a while, got in the shower, got back out of the shower, said, you know what? I just had a really good idea on how we can test this. Right, Zach? <laughs> oh, yeah. So what he did then is... Um, he went and he got himself some balloons, all right? And this was brilliant that you thought of this. Um, so we are going to take electronics out of the equation altogether. And so what he did on this one, and, and Zach, I'm going to actually let you describe what you did on this one and, and uh, what you came up with. And this is shot in our kitchen. <laughs> Excuse the mess. But uh, kind of describe what you did here. Yeah, yeah I took a... A little pin, one of Karen B's little pins that she has, and uh, I connect that to the Van de Graaff this time and tethered it with some balloons to where it hovered just off the ground. And when I apply a charge to it, it automatically would attract itself to the ground and stick. The neat part was is until I discharged the Van de Graaff, the second time I had to discharge the negative as well, it would stay on the ground. Mm-hmm which makes me think anything producing any type of a positive charge, like the human body, would be stuck to the ground. Okay. So what happened when you reversed the polarity? Um, did you actually get it to go up 
uh, and away uh, to a higher elevation. I thought I did it first, but it was the balloons interacting with the Van de Graaff. Remember, we were getting ready to head out to eat, so I was just kind of hurrying. And then when I got back and did it in the kitchen with more room, I realized that it really didn't push it up. I didn't see any change in it. But okay. the positive is about five times stronger than the negative. So if I can get more power to it, I'm going to try. I've been thinking about how to get more power, more negative of a static charge. Okay. So anyway, the bottom line is, is that what we have seen here is that for whatever reason, and this is something that we're still trying to explore and, and figure out, we are getting a, a change in downward force, uh, a change in apparent gravity. Uh, by changing the charge potential. Uh, Boyd was able to do this by changing the magnetic field around it. Uh, Professor Lathwaite was able to do it by changing rotational properties, as was Bruce De Palma. In other words, there's all these things that seem to defy the law of physics as we understand them. And, um, you know, it, it seems like it's kind of a mystery in, in a lot of ways. Well, so enter my, my friend from, um, the, that is the PhD electrical engineer candidate, um, who has really been a, a great asset um, to our research. And I'm gonna read an email from him that he just sent me this morning, in fact, um, when I told him that, uh, uh, well, when he, when he realized that I was going to do this show on gravity and he kind of wanted to do this explanation. So let me read to you what he says and, um, you know, we'll kind of take that into consideration, see if we can, you know, bring it into this, uh, uh, this overall equation. So here we go. He says, Dear Bob, look, it's simple. All matter and objects more or less have EM even matter, have, have EM even matter we apparently describe as neutral, like a piece of wood, for example. Understand that at an atomic scale and therefore also macroscopic matter and objects would not exist if there was not EM energy within. I totally agree with that because everything is made, made up of charged particles. That's just a natural fact. Everything is influenced by charged particles and changes in charge, okay? All right, back to the letter. He says, the problem with gravity and EM misunderstanding begins because many people don't understand the difference between coherent EM and incoherent EM of matter in analogy to the coherent one, directional light of a laser beam and the incoherent omnidirectional light of an incandescent lamp. In other words, he's comparing this to, um, you know, when you have a laser beam, you have a coherent wave, uh, a coherent light, which at a very low power can do some very, very destructive things, right? A laser at uh, three watts can burn a hole right through anything, but a light bulb at three watts is barely even visible. Okay, so there's a big difference between the coherency and non-coherency of not only light, but this apparently is true uh, when it comes to EM fields. Um, okay, so he says, all matter emits both type of EM simultaneously. The incoherent all directional part or omnidirectional part and the coherent directional part more or less. The incoherent part of EM that matter emits at the macroscopic scale we call gravity. And yes, EM is a matter-induced phenomenon, and so its offspring, gravity. Believe it or not, matter attracts matter at the macro scale, and it's called gravity, or else incoherent macroscopic EM, which for reasons I don't want to explain right now, only has an attractive effect and no repulsion. Now, obviously, I'm going to push him on explaining that to me, um, why it, it seems to only have this attractive effect. Now, we've also heard scientists talk about uh, repulsive gravity. And now I haven't seen a whole lot on that, but I have brought it up in a few shows that we've talked about before. Um, so, yeah, it, apparently there's something to that, you know, apparently. But uh, I will say that in past conversations with my friend, he has admitted that, you know, it's very difficult to test this, if not impossible, because of the overriding uh, downward or gravitational force, if you will, of the Earth, right? It's hard to get a, a bead on this. And, and of course, I think the Cavendish experiments is, is just way too inconclusive 
um, to be proof of anything. So, okay, continuing on. He says, now, depending on how strong a matter has intrinsically the coherent part of EM, thus its ability to direct EM energy to a specific direction, like, for example, the north-south magnetic axis of magnet, uh, besides its incoherent EM part, which is always there in every matter and we call gravity, we have the different types of EM charged matter. Depending on the preferred polarization vector, each of this matter types uh, exhibits electric vector E or magnetic 90 degrees relative to vector M. Now, one thing I want you guys to remember, uh, we have talked about counter space or the ether being a 90 degree uh, divergent vector from the EM uh, wave itself. And this is what they are calling uh, the ether or um, the quantum field or whatever you want to call it. Of course, I think quantum field is not a good term for it because uh, that goes into quantum mechanics and that's just a road that leads to disinformation. All right. So anyway, what was I? Uh, exhibits electric E or magnetic 90 degrees uh, relative vector M. We categorize them as insulator, dielectric, or conductive, ferromagnetic, magnetic, or paramagnetic, and diamagnetic. Okay. So he says, here you have it. There's no simpler explanation I can give you. So, for example, a piece of wood has a very little to almost none of the coherent part of it EM and therefore non-magnetic or electric conductive. But all matter independent of their EM coherency have the incoherent part of EM and therefore mass and gravity. So what he is saying here, guys, is he's saying that what you are affecting, Zach, with your electric field is the coherent part of this field, right? This, this uh, charge field or gravitational field. You're actually affecting that, uh, disrupting it, I would say, more or less, um, with the charge potential. That also is true of what's going on, I believe, with the rotational properties like the De Palma spinning ball and the Eric Lathwaite gyroscope uh, experiments. So to say, I, I guess to wrap this up in a nutshell, and I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole in this, um, we have a long ways to go, I believe, in exploring this particular subject. But to close it off and simply say, well, you know, mass attracts mass and that's it, um, I, I think really leaves us uh, short-sighted because there seem to be so many other things that are involved here. And that's one of the reasons why I keep going back to this and trying to bring the electrical field equation into this. And if you listen to my friend's uh, uh, explanation, um, he seems to, you know, have a beat on it by saying that this is de de disrupting the coherency of these fields. Um, and that's something that, that I definitely want to go into further. But uh, isn't it interesting that we seem to have this phenomenon and it can be affected? And I think one of the reasons they don't want us going down this rabbit hole is because the government has already figured this out. And, you know, if you ever see like the Nazi experiments and stuff like that, uh, you've noticed that, or anybody that has witnessed like these UFOs that are exhibiting uh, anti-gravitic uh, type of behavior, A, you always seem to see some sort of rotational thing like on the old Nazi crap, you know, that's going on on the bottom. Or they say there is static discharges that are going on, right? So again, they are affecting this field, um, but they don't want us to know what the actual nature of this field is. So that's why I keep going back to this. Uh, you guys have any comments on this? One thing that I wanted to add was uh, what I find fascinating is, and I lament this, is think of all of the university students, all the scientists that over the last hundreds of years, that if, if, if science came out and said, we don't know what, what, what is happening here, think of all the experiments that could have been done, all the, all, the, all, the, all the students out there working on this and coming up with new ideas and new sciences and new, and new physics that we could greatly improve our society. And because we, you know, science has created this idea that we know everything, nobody explores anything anymore. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, they want you to believe they've got it all figured out. And, you know, as I said many times, since the introduction of, of Einstein coming on the scene with his relativity BS nonsense um, that they keep trying to, to prop up constantly. And that right there should be a big red flag to any researcher to watch the way that the mainstream is always coming and saying, oh, Einstein has been proven right once again. It's like, no, it is blatantly not true. Einstein has been disproven so many times 
it, it boggles the mind. And this is the, you know, this is what's happened. They try and lead people away from the, the true science that, you know, Heaviside, Tesla, James Clerk Maxwell, um, all of these people that were around before Einstein and, they, and that were actually on the correct track, um, this is what they're trying to steal, steer people away from. This is also why they don't teach about um, certain experiments like the, uh, the, the true nature of the Michelson-Morley. They try and obfuscate the Michelson-Morley uh, about the nature of the ether. Um, and they try and tell you that the ether doesn't exist. Well, you know, as I have said before, we have had some really astounding results on this uh, ether rotation that we have come up with uh, in FE core and the fiber optic gyro. And again, this is something that's going to take a little bit of time to put all this together. But our results thus far are showing an absolute, absolute distinct change in rotational velocity at different altitudes on the same latitude line, which absolutely should not be happening on a ball earth model. That tells us that it's not the ball earth that it's registering. It's registering something else. And what we're trying to do, um, you know, like I said, we've got a variance of uh, up to and a little bit over one degree in the ether itself. Um, and this would uh, tend to explain a lot. Now, I've been thinking about this and and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, or, or I, I may be wrong in, in my interpretation of this, but I believe that the ether, um, well, let's just, let's just not put faster or slower. The ether is rotating at different speeds from high to low. And if the sun and the stars are focal points that become manifest within the ether itself, then isn't it interesting that, that if the stars and the sun and the moon um, are all at different elevations above the Earth, and, and there is fairly good evidence to indicate that that is actually true. Um, we have our different rotational rates, i.e. the sidereal day, which is 23 hours and 56 minutes, the solar day of 24 hours, and then you also have the moon, which, you know, is a little bit slower yet, and that is, you know, personified uh, kind of by the story of the rabbit and the, uh, the tortoise, right? Um, that there's a metaphor for that particular phenomenon. So what I'm saying is, is that uh, I think what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to make a concrete lock um, between the rotational properties of the ether and the different levels of what we're seeing in the heavens, the different speed of the, the stars versus the different speed of the sun versus the different speed of the moon. Um, and they are all definitely different not a whole lot of difference in between them. But then again, there is a difference. And in a ball earth model, that shouldn't be happening, folks. So this is kind of where we're going to be going with this particular um, information. All right, so that's it for that. Now, last thing I want to cover before we call this a show, um, guys. Oh, first of all, is any other any other comments on this at all before I move on? No, I think yeah. it's pretty crazy that we're getting different weights when you change the charge potential of the items being weighed, you know? And the balloons, they seem to show me that electricity uh, is everywhere, naturally, right? It's the same with magnetic properties and even the uh, the ball that you showed with Lathwaite. So I just look at it as its natural fact. I struggled to follow a little bit your PhD friend. I'll have to watch it back again and read the email uh, through because it was a little, a little high level, a little bit over my head. Um, but I think that mass, attracting mass, like he said, is so uh, simplified, and, and I feel it's, it's wrong. You know, everything is electric. Uh, charged particles or charged potential is everywhere, and it's inherent in everything. Uh, some things more than others. So could electricity be what's setting the downward direction? Absolutely. Can it be proven? Eh. Well, I think that's We're a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes it a little bit more difficult because of it being inherent in everything. And... Uh, it may just be a natural law, and electricity certainly might be what's causing it. But once it's been established, and it has, the downward direction has been established, then I think relative density sorts everything out uh, within this electromagnetic field and creates what they call gravity. So I'm, I'm right along with it, and I uh, can't wait to see more. Absolutely. See, there you are, guys. See, Jaron and I really aren't that far apart. <laughs> we just, like, you know, like most people, everybody looks at it in their own way, and, you know, Unfortunately, I think words get in the way a lot of the time of the concepts that we see in our heads. Um, because, you know, usually after you work through discussions like this, 
you you kind of realize that oh well you know what maybe we're we're not so far apart after all and we're really kind of talking about the same thing and you know above all i have to say that you know not only does science not really have a good grasp on what electricity even is and they don't and they will admit this to you in school um you know, it's like they'll say well we really <laughs> we really don't understand what's going on with electricity or, or what the true nature of it is. But what we do know is that we can control it in these specific ways, right? We also know that it has certain associations like magnetism and apparently gravity that um, are definitely there. And this is something that I think has been purposely uh, obfuscated, uh, you know, to us uh, in order to keep the elite secrets. And, um, you know, there's a lot of really nifty experiments that are going on, and we do have some very high-level academics that are working with this uh, behind the scenes, and I, I expect some really great things from them, and, uh, you know, and even the experiments that FE Core is doing. So um, I love it. This is a great, great subject, and uh, certainly I don't think anybody should be calling anybody else a shill because they uh, accept certain parameters of uh, gravitation or don't. Um, or to be toe-tagging people. I mean, that's juvenile and ridiculous. Um, but that's the way, you know, that's unfortunately the way things go on. So anyway, all right, so we'll leave that behind. Last thing I want to cover, and this is something that David Weiss dropped into chat um, a few weeks ago, and I've kind of followed it. But there's this guy. Um, his channel is called Florida Marquee. And I don't think he's exactly flat earth friendly because you know, when I uh, made the comment on one of his previous videos saying, gee, I wonder what these lines would look like if they were uh, drawn out on an AE map. I didn't even say flat earth. I said AE map. But, of course, it was under the Globebusters account. He hid the comment. <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right. Well, I know how you feel about flat earthers. But not very friendly. Yeah, not very friendly. <laughs> but nevertheless, what he has discovered is something that is pretty flipping amazing. And what it is, is that the first thing that he found was down in the Brazilian, uh, down in Brazil, uh, the U.S. military bought a land, a, a parcel of land that is down here on the eastern side of Brazil. And ironically, when you zoom into it, and I don't think it's on this video, but if you go to his channel and look at this, there is an area there that is cleared out in the middle of the forest no roads leading into it, nothing like that, but it's cleared out in the, in, in, in the shape of a pentagon. Now, it's not just the shape of any pentagon, but the dimensions of the lines inside of this pentagon are each 1,666 feet on each side. Wow, okay, that's pretty mind-blowing. But beyond that, um, it those dimensions that it has are precisely the same as the inter inner courtyard of our Pentagon in Washington, D.C., right? That's pretty crazy, too. But it gets even more interesting than that, folks. And this is something I'm definitely going to be looking into because this is just blowing my mind. But if you take these, these uh, vectors that, coming in, that come into these pentagons and you trace them around the world, you find that they go into other obscure areas that seem to be pentagons that are cleared out, like over here in Africa, down in Antarctica, um, over here in Argentina. Um, it's absolutely mind-boggling, you know, what's going on here. And uh, I, I don't have any explanation. I don't even know what's going on with this, but just the fact that we've got these pentagonal clearings going on all around the world, and they all seem to be associated with each other, is bizarre, completely bizarre. So what is going on? Well, this this base was bought apparently uh, for a new place to launch rockets from. And of course, yeah, wouldn't you know it that they'd want it, you know, right here on the coast so they can launch the rockets into the ocean because we all know that's where they go anyway. Um, but yeah, there's something energetically uh, and geometrically very special about these locations. So I don't know, Jaron, did you ever get a chance to check out any of these at all? I did. I watched a few of them. I thought they were really interesting. Yeah, I mean, do you have any idea what might be going on here, or are you in the dark of this that I am? It's just bizarre. Just bizarre. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty incredible stuff. I mean, there's definitely clearings going on. It's certainly interesting that the ones he's finding line up 
but no, I don't have much more information on it besides that. Just watching and kind of being in in shock of some of the stuff he's finding. Yeah, yeah, it really is amazing. And uh, you know, like I said, I I was really interested in if you were to take these plot points, and I'm sure somebody in the FE community will do it, um, because, and here's the reason I say this, because you know we talked about before, uh, if you take the ley lines, right, the ley lines that have been doused out, you know, and you know you can see them on a globe and all that, and they, they form an interesting pattern on a globe. But when you project those ley lines out to a flat Earth map, something magical happens. Um, it turns from this, this rather mundane geometrical pattern uh, from the Earth to uh, a flower of life, right? Everybody's seen the sacred geometrical pattern, the flower of life. And in fact, on my old Xanadude 60 logo, I had it overlaid on the flat Earth map. Absolutely astounding. So I'm just curious if somebody takes these points that he has mapped out and vectored and projected them on a flat earth map, exactly what would happen. Uh, he's obviously not going to do it because he's definitely not uh, wanting to associate with any flat earthers, I think. But nevertheless, something I would check out, I will put this in the show notes. Uh, Florida Marquis, he's got like four or five, well, this is part five. Uh, he's got uh, a bunch of videos on this series, and it is absolutely mind boggling. And uh, somebody that may be able to explain this um, is uh, FPV Angel. And by the way, I want to give a shout out to FPV Angel. Um, I started really kind of looking at his channel. You know, he's been around in the community forever. Um, he is a person that has a little bit different idea of what's going on uh, in this model. And I applaud that because he backs it up with some fabulous research. Um, so I have been kind of checking out his channel. And uh, he comes at this. Uh, from a very different angle, and I think it's something that's really worth investigating. Uh, I gotta gotta give him kudos. You know, I don't know if I agree with it yet or not, but uh, the amount of evidence and the way that he coherently uh, puts it towards his model is astounding. Really, really good work. So shout out to FPV Angel. Uh, if you're not subscribed to him, go check out his work. He's a heck of a nice guy, and he has got some really, really amazing research going on. So. There you have it. Okay, guys, um, that is about all I have. Um, is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we call it a show? Bob, I'd like to check in. Dave here. Hey, Dave. Oh, boy. <laughs> hey. I mean, hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. hey. so well, <laughs> first I want to say amazing show. And for, you know, you'll be out there researching Flat Earth and, and getting trolled by people. I mean, when I say you're, I'm talking about everybody. And one of their favorite lines is, flat earth is dead, it's over. And you've shown today, on today's show, that that is the farthest thing from the truth. Not only are more and more people becoming flat earthers every day, their best proofs are becoming flat earth proofs, which you've shown. I mean, what do they have left? They have nothing. Anybody? Aristophanes uh, <laughs> put some sticks in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Refraction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so I mean, when people say, you know, there there is no proof that the opposite's true. You know, when someone says you have no proof, I'm like, yes, I do. We can see too far. What do you have? And they have nothing. They have shadows under clouds from Mount Rainier. They have looming. They have nonsense. So um, I'm feeling super positive that this we are starting to steamroll. And uh, I don't know what that's going to do, you know, what they're going to do about it. But they're going to try to do something, in my opinion. Well, so, did you see the headline on, on Drudge where it says that the U.S. is unleashing the military to fight disinformation? Anyway, I just, no. <laughs> That's what's well, coming. Well, and then I also want to point out that Bob is actually the nicest person in Flat Earth because, <laughs> <laughs> because this gravity, this little downward force thing, Jaron was wrong. We were right. <laughs> you're saying, <laughs> okay, I know you want to say it, but you're too nice, so I'm going to say it. Jaron was wrong, and we were right. <laughs> Team Bob and Dave, not that we came up with it, and Team Jaron is uh, wrong. So I just needed to point that out. <laughs> Love you, you Jaron. Feel better now, Dave? <laughs> I, felt I still feel good, so okay, that's good. it. Just checking. <laughs> um, but I want to say uh, awesome, awesome, amazing show. Paige and I were listening, and uh, it was just it's mind-blowing how ridiculous the globe is. Yeah, absolutely true. And uh, All right. 
Yeah. Well, well, thanks for that, Dave. And, and I agree with you too. Uh, the, the ball earth really has nothing left but insults, um, you know, character assassination, uh, lies, I, you name it. And, I mean, and it's, their best proofs are now flat earth proofs. It's when you really sit down. Look, the problem is the problem is on these things that take, you know, you, you said you and Jaron were taking time and we all did trying to figure out what's going on with Mount Rainier and, uh, and other things. Ballers are, are people that really refuse to think because if you really use your brain, you know, cle- you know, make it get rid of the fluoride so you can think, um, and look in the, into the, the world, you know, the, the aspects of the world of how the world is, you can clearly see it's not a ball. But the problem is most people are so brainwashed, so chemically influenced, so, you know, completely brainwashed that they don't know how to think. And, um, you know, those people won't look at these proofs. And, and that's that's the biggest challenge that we have is getting the, the ballers, you know, to actually think. And, and it, it's it's frustrating. The Globe Lie Tour, just listening to them, they're the same thing. The, the people are just making up stuff to to defend their ball position. But they have, you know, I love they ask, what's your one reason? What's your best reason? And, and nobody can even come up with one reason that they believe in the ball. It's just it's just amazing. I'm done. Yep. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Well, it's kind of like that guy, uh, Carlos Pagan, that, that is always kind of, you know, on your shows, Jaron, and stuff. And the show that you guys did, and, and uh, you were talking to him and said, well, what's your best ball earth proof, right? And he didn't have an answer. And I just thought at that time, it's like, and he wants to come on to Globusters and school us? <laughs> Pathetic. You know, really bad. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree. They just... You know, their their proofs do not, they do not uh, hold water. They really don't. And, you know, again, you see them trying to uh, obfuscate and discredit the obvious. They they will not acknowledge the obvious, just like, the you know, the Bob the Science Guy and his, his ridiculous assertions. And granted, like I said, Jaron and I, when we first saw that, uh, we spent a fair amount of time talking about that, trying to figure out exactly what was going on. And, you know, the last I remember us talking about it, Jern, we had both kind of thought, well, maybe it's it's reflecting water off of, the, you know, the sunlight reflecting off of the ocean and, you know, coming off of uh, the, the or snow, could have been snow, uh, and causing the shadow to be cast upward. But it honestly never occurred, I think, to either one of us, even though I have seen the you know, top of Mount Rainier peek out from above the clouds many times on flights in never occurred to either one of us that that's what was going on. But that's the power of, of, you know, somebody that has great observational skills like pea brain. And, you know, honestly, I think collectively the flat earthers uh, are way smarter than the globe earthers um, on our uh, observations and assertions. And, you know, that's a pretty sad state considering the globe earthers outnumber us a million to one. Right. (laughs) So anyway, okay. Well, um, with that, I guess we're going to uh, call it a show then, guys. So we'll go around one more time. And Zach, um, you know, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, I will bring up your web page here. Oh, yeah, let me show this really quick. So if you guys want to subscribe to um, Zachary Zabala, Good Times for All, I'm showing his uh, YouTube channel right now. And, uh, you know, he just does all kinds of nifty uh, observations and experiments, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him on here. Thank so. you so much for having me, guys. This has been awesome. And David, thank you so much for all the help with the videos, man. If you guys didn't notice the balloon one, that's all Dave. I just gave him the video, and he ran with it. So yeah, I appreciate all the help. Uh, no problem. With your with your awesome camera work, I figured I could add a little something to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely needs it. Yep. Okay, great. Oh, also, yes, David, David Gordon, thank you much. Uh, just for those of you uh, here in Colorado or in Denver, uh, we've got the F- FE5280 meetup meet uh, that we have the first Wednesday of every month at the Goose Town Tavern in Denver uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. The address is 3242 East Colfax, um, and that will be coming up this Wednesday, and we will all be there. So, i uh, love to see you guys down there. Thanks, David, for reminding me of that. And, uh, okay, so, Zach, do you have anything else that you want to uh, tell people about that you're going to be doing in the future um, or anything like that that you want to plug? 
Yeah, um, actually, um, Cammie, Bob's wife, and I are going to be at FE Core International 2019 in Dallas uh, putting on a workshop. And um, if there's anything that I've done in the past that you think might be relevant, it's going to be called How the World Works. Um, We're going to cover a little bit of perspective, a little bit of electricity, a little bit of magnetism. But uh, if there's anything you really loved that I've done before, um, put a comment in one of my things and I'll get it. Okay. You know what? um, You know what, Zach? I can think of one thing that I would really like to see repeated live, uh, if at all possible, was was your experiment where you took uh, a cylinder that I believe just had air in it and you put a gauge at the bottom and a gauge at the top and you showed that there was a pressure differential uh, from top to bottom in a container, right? Just a, a simple container like you were using. That, I'd love to see you do that. Yeah, that's an easy one. We could definitely do that one for sure. Yep. So anyway, just a thought. All right. Well, beautiful, Zach. We will we'll do that. And we look forward to seeing yours and uh, Cammie's presentation uh, at FEIC. It's not FE Core, but <laughs> that's Yeah, right. sorry about that. That's hey, no brain reason. part there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Flat Earth International Conference 2019. They will be doing a workshop um, called How the World Works. And uh, I believe Cammie's also going to be doing another workshop uh, with Shelley Lewis. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting. Looking forward to seeing that. So, all right. So let's come around to Ben. Ben, uh, besides the Globebusters Pro, uh, do you have any other wonderful ideas that you want to <laughs> grace us with? Oh, uh, no. I'm going to be working hard on that Globebusters Pro for a little bit to, to get that going. Um, please, people, don't forget. And uh, uh, if, really, if you, if you do have a professional and you think you have some insight there, please, please email us at globebusterspro at jaronism.com. And I wanted to thank uh, Zach for his wonderful channel. I think some of your insights are just fantastic. I really, my, still my favorite was the, the setting flashlight. We had that flashlight set in a warehouse. That, that was fantastic. But uh, thanks to everybody else as well. All right. Thanks, man. Beautiful. Okay. And David, is there anything you want to plug while you're still here? Um. I uh, did an update on the app for anyone that has iOS, still working on Android, where we have a night light. Um, if you want to use it as your night clock, there's a little button. You can set the in settings. You can set it what brightness, and then it'll just stay on at a very low brightness so you can sleep with it um, and see what time it is if you want. So it's on there, um, and uh, Android will be coming this, this coming week. Awesome. That'll be a yeah. nifty little feature. I like that. Good one. Yeah, it's a little button to the right of the digital time. And I also made it in settings. A lot of people asked they wanted 24-hour time on the digital also. So there's a widget on there you can turn on uh, 12 or 24. Um, so little improvements. And uh, it, it's still, you know, I got the Globe Light Tour giving out um, cards. And I'm also, I'm, I'm actually giving them the profits from all the apps that are sold in uh, Europe during the tour. Um, from giving out the cards, because I, I really believe that, you know, when when people want to research Flat Earth, you can't research Flat Earth very easily anymore. You you research on YouTube, you go backwards. It's like literally going to the Flat Earth Society by typing in Flat Earth. Um, so the, the app really it brings everybody to the daily videos, the archive videos, the 21 questions. So, you know, share the app with people and uh, and and. It really, it's been way, I I get so many messages of people that got the app, didn't believe in Flat Earth, and uh, the daily videos uh, woke them up. So share it around and and, uh, that's it. Hey, David, maybe it's impossible, but uh, I I see on the app right now that the moon stays on a static path. Is it possible to have that uh, moon path? Yeah, I'm working on it. Because I'm working I, on that. For me, it's it's an important thing coming up in November. I think we should be doing the the, the moonlight test because that's when the, the moon will be closest and it'll be a full moon. The, um, the issue is I have the moon bigger than the sun just so people can see the phases because we tried it out smaller and people just when it's a sliver or a quarter moon, they're like, where the heck is the moon? They can't see it. So I made it bigger. Um, I eventually will get it to migrate, but uh, getting that data in there is – just weighs down the app as far as uh, megabytes in size, and uh, and it's already it, co- it we're we're already maxing out, um, you know how big an app should be. So we're looking at ways to compress the information, all the backgrounds and stuff, 
take up a lot of space. I'm I'm working on that. Thank you. One, awesome. uh, I'm adding a new I'm adding a new compass. I, I got the compass in there where it has a needle, but I'm actually going to change the compass to where the entire clock spins and like a real compass would spin. Um, and and then you just turn the phone around until you line the north up with the top. I think that'll I think people will like that a lot better. So we'll see what happens with that. It's going to be a couple weeks out. Awesome. And uh, the last. The last thing I want to say is, as you were talking about before, it's conference season. If there's a conference anywhere near you, you got to go. It's it's a life-changing event. The two conferences I went to, um, I wouldn't miss them for the world. Yeah, and you know what? These conferences, you got to travel. You got to get hotel, the tickets. It, it adds up, but you got to treat it like a vacation. It really is a vacation, um, and it's it's worth taking your vacation time and your vacation money and going to a conference. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just because if you're listening to the show and you're, you know, you realize that the earth is not a spinning ball. Um, you're, you have a, a, your, your friends have changed. You know, you're around people that are sleeping and you have a lot less in common than you did before. You come to the conference, the energy is insane. It's so amazing being around all of these people awake, not just to the non, the ball deception, but to everything else that, you know, fluoride and chemtrails and, and, you know, everything. So it's not to be missed. Um, make your hotel reservations, get your tickets and go because it will change your life. And, and as I said, especially if you're a baller, not many ballers are listening to the show, real ballers. Um, go nobody goes to the conference pays attention and leaves a leaves a globe believer nobody that's true absolutely true all right well beautiful thanks david for that and uh yeah i'm definitely looking forward to it for sure and uh you know I, I, there is kind of one other thing i want to talk about just for a minute um before we take off and i was thinking this week with all the suppression and all the uh you know YouTube, YouTube censoring us and suppressing all of our things. And, you know, in general, I think this is being done in Google searches, even for web pages. Um, I was thinking that, you know, the Globe Earth tour or the Globe Light tour bus, uh, you know, and all the logos on the side is, is a good idea. But I was thinking about what if we could get um, everybody in the community to get behind one sort of like clearinghouse uh, like website. Uh, for example, and I am perfectly willing to offer this, but I have, I myself personally own one of the only flat earth domains that actually uh, will be intended for use with flat earth. Right now there's nothing on it, but I own the domain called flat earth.us or flat earth.s. Um, I own that and it's currently doing nothing. But what I was thinking was, is that what if we got all of the people in the community to say, all right, go to this website, and then, then what this website would be would be kind of like Stop, Look, Think is, you know, um, but specifically geared towards Flat Earth. And what it would have in it would be all like the really great content creators, not only on YouTube, but all the great websites. Um, and it's something that people can easily remember, Flat Earth.us, right? Um, I think that's, you know, a lot of people have kind of come up with that idea before, but I don't think anybody's ever really gotten behind um, you know, getting everybody in the community to tr try and promote something like this. So it's, it's an idea I'm kind of toying around with. And since, you know, I do happen to have that, that uh, gem of a domain name, Flat Earth Thought Us, um, I think, you know, I would be more than happy to contribute that to any web developer that would like to help us put those pieces together. And I'm sure William would, would probably be happy to do that. But, you know, as far as like conspiracy videos and, and flat earth and everything like that, stoplookthink.com is outstanding. Um, and that is another one of those clearing houses, but, uh, and maybe we could even link into a section of that, like the flat earth section uh, with the flat earth.us domain and, uh, you know, go with that. Anyway, it's a thought. Um, think about it, guys, and uh, if there's a better way to market Flat Earth and overcome the censorship that we have, um, I'm all for it, you know, because uh, obviously y Google and YouTube aren't going to help us, and there is a very concerted effort to keep this under wraps. Gee, I wonder why, um, because, you know, <laughs> it's not so foolish as people would have people believe. So anyway, there's that. All right, so that's my spiel. Last but not least, Jaron, we come around to you. 
And uh, what's going on with you? What's coming up? What's going on? Well, thanks, Bob. I think first, uh, that's a great idea as far as the Flat Earth.us. Uh, I don't know how much it would cost to host all those videos because I think if you just link back to YouTube might be an issue if videos go away or I, I don't know how that would all work, but great idea. Uh, nothing special is going on for me. I've started working on my presentation for Amsterdam at the end of this month, so got that going. Of course, as always, journalism raw with David on TFR on Monday nights, and uh, I'll be doing more live streams like I did Friday talking about the Amazonian fires and seeing them from space. So keep an eye on my channel, as always. Appreciate everyone who watches and shares. And, uh, you know, next movie's in the works, and we just keep plugging forward. But as, whoa, that was loud. But as far as who is right and who is wrong uh, concerning any topic, David, uh, it, it honestly doesn't matter to me. You know, Team Alba, Team Beal. Uh, many people have pointed out and said, or I don't know if people have noticed, but my, they see my non-confrontational style. And uh, a lot of people appreciate that. They thank me for that often. And uh, hopefully people see that when you're searching for the truth, that that's the best path. Jared, I, I, I have to agree with that. If, you, if I am proven wrong, that's awesome because I've learned something new. Correct. And I, I know you're the same way, but I just wanted to make sure that Bob pointed out that you were wrong and we were right. <laughs> Jeez. Yes, I get that. <laughs> I'm staying out of this. <laughs> no, and, and people, people who are out there who understand me, they know my position. They, uh, you have your beliefs, you have your worldview, and you open your mind to those of others and you listen. That's when you grow. When you try and force your beliefs on people, your ideas on others, you actually get quite a, cush, a pushback, and uh, people push back even harder because learning takes time. It doesn't bother me at all when people think that you're right or they're right or you're wrong. I don't claim to know anything. I'm on a path. I'm on a journey, if you want to call it that. And every step is growth. So some people need to listen more because standing in your beliefs and just screaming them is not helpful to you or anyone. So you got to open your mind, do your own research, all those things I always say, right? Make up your own mind. And sometimes you take a deep breath and you let people like David, I'm sorry, I mean, just people think that they've won and then you move forward on your path. It does no good sometimes to get caught up in... Uh, uh, who's right and who's wrong, but you can let other people believe that they've won. So congratulations, David. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Oh, man. I was starting to respect you. <laughs> no, nope. take, respect. take it right now. No, it's a, it's a non-confrontational style and it works well. Uh, you know, it's just like the conversations I have with Globe Believers on my channel. You know, could I get on there and just yell at them and scream and call them names and call them idiots and dumb? Yeah, sure, you can do that, but who is getting anywhere from that? Uh, sure, I have my beliefs, and I know what I believe, so does it do any good to just go and yell and shout those at people? Not really. Uh, I'd rather listen to their their side, kind of give them my side, and just have a good conversation that way, and that's how people grow. I think that's the best way. Uh, you've got other channels out there, mostly globe believers, who just scream and yell and call people names and think they're so smart and, and make fun of others and uh, that's how they go about their business. And I just don't think, because then eventually nobody watches them anymore. Sure, their their team members do. Uh, but as far as flat earthers, I don't think flat earthers are watching these guys' videos anymore thinking, okay, I'm going to get some sort of information here. That's not what's coming from them. And they've kind of turned off uh, that audience. And that's their own fault. I think a non-confrontational way uh, is a better way of getting your point across and also uh, learning from others. doesn't mean just because you listen to somebody and you're open to what they have to say doesn't mean that you have to uh, believe that it's just good for your personal growth. So hopefully that makes sense. Yep, I, I absolutely agree with that, Jaron. Hundred percent. I don't. I don't uh, appreciate or enjoy the confrontational uh, formats of some of the debate shows. Um, I think, frankly, they do more harm than good because they just simply uh, put us in a very bad light. But you know, that's my opinion. Other people. Well, I think the thing about that too is Bob that some people actually enjoy that. Yeah. And so. You Agreed. know, that's why, you know, for me, I just, you have to leave each thing up to each person. And I think the best way to build a YouTube channel, if anybody's, you know, doing that or thinking of doing that is to just be yourself, present things the way you want, present information the way that you would take it in. And everybody's different. And that's the great thing about YouTube. That's why you know, I don't say anything bad about YouTube. Think about the platform that they are that allows us to, uh, you know, be able to just press go live and you're able to talk to thousands of people. And uh, if they don't like what you're saying or they think it's ridiculous, well, then eventually people just won't watch you anymore. But, uh, uh, you know, that's why I think it's, you know, everybody, it's each, it's up to each person. That's what I'm saying. I would never say, oh, I don't like these 
debate shows because of the way that they're handled. Well, you know what? They get an audience. Some people enjoy that. Uh, is it for me? Is it for me every day? No, I don't want to hear the same thing, the same yelling. I don't really think I get any growth out of that. Uh, when I watch a show like Globusters back, I feel like I learn. I feel like when Bob presents, I get to listen to what he's got to say. I get to listen to other people's perspective, get to listen to Iru, get to listen to Ben, get to listen to David, get to listen to everybody. P-Brain, that's, I think, the best way to grow your knowledge base and to feel more comfortable in your position, and you just keep moving forward that way. So I, I totally agree, but I also think that you know everybody has their own um, ideas and their way they want to present information and uh, I'm all for it. You know, go for it. Whatever you want to do. I just know my style is different than everybody else's. Either you don't like me, maybe you don't watch any of my videos. That's that's your choice because maybe you don't like um, the way that I present things. Maybe some people do. It's up to each individual person. That's all I'm saying. Yep, exactly. And 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 that is kind of what I meant. You know, when I said I don't appreciate those type of uh, show formats, I don't. That's it's not. You know, I don't like the argumentative. Uh, stance the defensive stance the the name calling I, I don't like that that to me is a real turnoff and uh frankly right. i you know listen to george hanachuk you know that guy what's his name yeah yeah no doubt <laughs> yeah, listening to him on these uh flatter channels go back and forth i mean that there's no you're not learning anything there you know at least for me i mean i could listen to that guy scream and yell about how right he is all you know forever it, I mean, it's not going to get anywhere it's not going to help me it, it just shows me more about uh, the positions that globers take and how wrong they are in, in standing firm in them and you just go from there so no i totally agree with you yep exactly yeah i'm definitely no george nutcheck fan that's for sure but anyway <laughs> <laughs> all right guys well um that'll call we'll call that a show and uh, thanks for joining us uh, this week. And again, oh, by the way, shout out to all the super chatters. I know I don't acknowledge those like I should, but we do appreciate the super chats very much. Um, and thank you so much for, you know, supporting our channel and our work. Um, it, it is very much appreciated. And I will kind of endeavor in the future to, um, you know, make a, a little more of an effort to read those out. Um, we just get so wrapped up in our show. And I know I do specifically. Um, I'm not always keeping an eye on that uh, going on the show, but we do appreciate the super chats. Uh, and the people that are donating them. They mean a lot. Thank you from the bottom of my heart so, so much for that. Uh, we love it. All right, guys, uh, that's the show. We will see you next week. Until then, be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind because there's truth inside. Peace out, everybody. Peace. Peace. Peace.